Earlier he had recommended defense bases at to the North Pole. Admiral Byrd repeated the above points of view, resulting from his personal knowledge gathered both at the North and South Poles, before a news conference held for International News Service. When Byrd returned to the States, he was hospitalized and was not allowed to hold any more press conferences. In March 1955, he was placed in charge of Operation Deep Freeze, which was part of the International Geophysical Year 1957-1958 exploration of the Antarctic. He died, some have suggested he was murdered, in 1957. UFO researchers are also aware of strange sightings of flying saucers with swastikas or iron crosses on them, aliens speaking German, etc. Note, I have also heard of abductees who have been taken to underground bases with swastika emblems on the walls or as in the case of abductee Alex Christopher, have seen reptiloids and Nazis working together aboard intergravity craft or within underground bases. So Barney Hill was not the only one to describe the Nazi connection to UFO abductions. Branton. An example is the American Reinhold Schmidt, whose father was born in Germany, who tells in his book Incident at Kearney, Nebraska that he was taken on a flying saucer on several occasions. He said the crew spoke German and acted like German soldiers. He said they took him to the polar region. If someone were making up a story, why would they claim to be taken, of all places, to the pole? Note, other sources have implied that an underground Nazi base exists somewhere in Nebraska. Branton, after returning he was subjected to persecution by the, the United States government. His description of the aerial discs matched pictures captured from the Germans. Note. For videos detailing an in-depth historical analysis of the Nazi cults, numerous details on the Nazi aerial disc projects, as well as actual photo footage retrieved from classified sources of these aerial discs in operation, and also investigations into the New Berlin bases below Neuschwabenland, Antarctica, contact Vladimir Terzisky, President, American Academy of Dissident Scientists, 10970 Ashton Avenue No. 310, Los Angeles. California, 90024, phone and fax, USA, 310-473-9717. Branton, in 1959, three large newspapers in Chile reported front-page articles about UFO encounters where the crew members appeared to be German soldiers. In the 1960s there were reports in New York and New Jersey of flying saucer aliens who spoke German, or English with a German accent. In the Julius and Ethel Rosenberg atomic espionage trials, they spoke of warships of space. Since they had access to top secret information, about what were they talking? Hitler escaped. I remember hearing, in the 1950s, rumors that Hitler had escaped to a secret Nazi base at the South Pole. In 1952, Dwight D. Eisenhower said, We have been unable to unearth one bit of tangible evidence of Hitler's death. Many people believe that Hitler escaped from Berlin. When President Truman asked Joseph Stalin at the Potsdam Conference in 1945 whether or not Hitler was dead, Stalin replied bluntly, no. Stalin's top army officer, Marshal Gregory Zhukov, whose troops were the ones to occupy Berlin, flatly stated after a long thorough investigation in 1945, we have found no corpse that could be Hitler's. The chief of the United States Trial Council at Nuremberg, Thomas J. Dodd, said, no one can say he's dead. Major General Floyd Parks, who was commanding general of the, the United States sector in Berlin, stated for publication that he had been present when Marshal Zhukov described his entrance to Berlin, and Zhukov stated he believed Hitler might have escaped. Lieutenant General Bettel Smith, chief of staff to General Eisenhower in the European invasion and later director of the CIA, stated publicly on October 12, 1945, no human being can say conclusively that Hitler is dead. Colonel W. J. Heimlich former chief, United States Intelligence, at Berlin, stated for publication that he was in charge of determining what had happened to Hitler and after a thorough investigation his report was, there was no evidence beyond that of hearsay to support the theory of Hitler's suicide. He also stated, on the basis of present evidence, no insurance company in America would pay a claim on Adolf Hitler. Nuremberg Judge Michael Musmano said in his book, Ten Days to Die, Russia must accept much of the blame to the extent that it still exists that Hitler did not die in May 1945. However, Musmano stated that he interviewed Hitler's personal waiter, his valet, his chauffeur, his two secretaries, pilots, top generals, etc., and they all agreed perfectly that Hitler committed suicide.
He said they could not have gotten together afterward and made up a story that agreed in perfect detail without one flaw anywhere, so they must be telling the truth. And he was absolutely convinced that Hitler committed suicide. The story at first sounds convincing, until you realize that they could have memorized a story beforehand. And these were all people who almost worshipped Hitler. Do witnesses ever agree perfectly in detail in real life? Former Secretary of State Jimmy Burns in his book, Frankly Speaking, as quoted in the April 1948 The Cross and the Flag, while in Potsdam at the conference of the Big Four, Stalin left his chair, came over and clinked his liquor glass with mine in a very friendly manner. I said to him, Marshal Stalin, what is your theory about the death of Hitler? Stalin replied, he is not dead. He escaped either to Spain or Argentina. I still have the September, 1948, issue of a magazine called The Plain Truth with a headline article, Is Hitler Alive or Dead? Subtitled, here is summarized the conclusions of an exhaustive three-year investigation, together with reasons for believing Hitler may be alive and secretly planning the biggest hoax of all history. Another article in November, 1949, says the Nazis went underground, May 16, 1943 and details a meeting at the residence of Krupp von Bohl in Halbach, the head of IG Farben, etc., at which they planned for World War III. Another article in August, 1952, entitled Hitler did not die, subtitled, Adolf Hitler's fake suicide and his Berlin bunker now is exposed as history's greatest hoax. Positive evidence comes to light that Hitler did not die, here's new evidence that Hitler is alive, directing the Nazi underground, today. The June 1952, issue of The Plain Truth is headlined, Hitler may be alive. The article states, now, new facts, or purported facts, leak out. It's reported now that in 1940 the Nazis started to amass tractors, planes, sledges, gliders, and all sorts of machinery and materials in the South Polar regions, that for the next four years Nazi technicians built, on an almost unknown continent, Antarctica, the Furish Shangri-La, a new Berchtesgaden. The report says they scooped out an entire mountain, built a new refuge completely camouflaged, a magic mountain hideaway. The recently discovered continent is larger than Europe minus 5,600 miles from Africa, 1,900 miles from the southern tip of South America, 4,800 miles from Australia. It is not a mere ice-covered surface, but a real continent, with plains, valleys, mountain peaks up to 15,000 feet. The temperature in the interior is around zero in the summer, and never drops below 20 or 30 degrees below in the winter. In other words, it is not as cold as in parts of North Dakota or Canada. Especially underground, where the natural temperature would be in the 50s, even below snow and ice. Branton, Bonjour, Magazine, The, Police Gazette, and the Paris newspaper, Le Monde, all had articles about Hitler's South Pole hideaway. Admiral Dönitz, in 1943, stated, the German submarine fleet has even now established an earthly paradise, an impregnable fortress, for the Führer, in whatever part of the world. Although he did not specify where the exact location was, Bonjour pointed out that in 1940 Nazi engineers had begun construction of buildings that were to withstand temperatures to 60 degrees below zero. There have been strong rumors, from the end of the war, that Hitler escaped to the South Pole. Yet, most people simply refuse to believe the evidence. The idea that Hitler survived the war is just unacceptable. It is too upsetting to too many people. There is plenty of proof that the Americans and Russians lied about what happened to Hitler, and there are strong rumors that he escaped to Antarctica. There is ample proof that a major group of Nazis escaped to Argentina. What do you think? Why did Admiral Byrd lead an invasion to Antarctica, and why the extreme secrecy about the whole situation? In 1981, Donald McHale wrote, Hitler the survival myth to try to lay to rest the questions about what happened to Hitler. The Flyleaf says, in this book a distinguished historian examines the post-war world's most absorbing and persistent mystery, revealing why it has endured and where the mystery leads. The back Flyleaf says, absolute certainty about what happened still eludes us today. Just recently on TV there are still programs telling, at last, the final, once and for all, this is the real story about what happened to Hitler. Yet they all do not really answer the question. A recent TV program, called What Really Happened to Adolf Hitler, after investigating numerous stories, ends by saying that, in spite of Glasnost and the new freedom of access to Russian files, the files on Hitler are still some of the most highly classified items of the Soviets.
The Diario Illustrado of Santiago, Chile, January 18, 1948 issue, said, on 30th of April, 1945, Berlin was in dissolution but little of that dissolution was evident at Templehof airfield. At 4.15 p.m. a Ju-52 landed and SS troops directly from Reckland for the defense of Berlin disembarked, all of them young, not older than 18 years. The gunner in the particular plane was an engineer by the name of B. whom I had known for a number of years and for whom I had endeavored to get exemption from military service. He sought to tank up and leave Berlin as quickly as possible. During this refueling interval Mr. B was suddenly elbowed in the ribs by his radio operator with a nod to look in a certain direction. At about 100-120 meters he saw a sleek Messerschmitt jet model 332 An editorial comment says this should be an Arado 234. Mr. B and the radio operator saw, and without any doubt whatsoever, standing in front of the jet, their commander-in-chief, Adolf Hitler, dressed in field gray uniform and gesticulating animatedly with some party functionaries, who were obviously seeing him off. For about 10 minutes whilst their plane was being refueled the two men observed this scene and around 4.30 p.m. they took to the air again. They were extremely astonished to hear during the midnight military news bulletin, some seven and a half hours later, that Hitler had committed suicide. On a Canadian Broadcasting Corporation program called As It Happens, September 17, 1974 at 7.15 p.m. comma Professor Dr. Ryder Sagane, oral surgeon from the dental faculty of the University of California at Los Angeles, said that Hitler had ordered a special plane to leave from Berlin with all medical and dental records, especially x-rays, of all top Nazis for an unknown destination. He said that the dental records used to identify Hitler's body were drawn from memory by a dental assistant, WHO disappeared and was never found. An editorial in Zigzag, Santiago, Chile, January 16, 1948, states that on April 30, 1945, flight captain Peter Baumgart took Adolf Hitler, his wife Eva Braun, as well as a few loyal friends by plane from Tempelhof Airport to Tondern in Denmark, still German-controlled. From Tondern, they took another plane to Christiansand in Norway, also German-controlled. From there they joined a submarine convoy, UFO Letzt Geheim Waft F3 Rikers, Matern, pages 50-51. The Jewish writer Michael Barzahar in The Avengers, p. 99, said, in 1943 Admiral Donitz had declared, the German U-boat fleet is proud to have made an earthly paradise, an impregnable fortress for the Führer, somewhere in the world. He did not say in what part of the world it existed, but fairly obviously it was in South America. The German writer Mattern said that Admiral Donitz told a graduating class of naval cadets in Kiel in 1944, the German Navy has still a great role to play in the future. The German Navy knows all hiding places for the Navy to take the Führer to, should the need arise. There he can prepare his last measures in complete quiet. Polar Defenses One thing that Admiral Byrd stated in the press conference after his defeat at Antarctica was that the Antarctic continent should be surrounded by a wall of defense installations since it represented the last line of defense for America. Although though the United States and Russia had been allies during the war, suddenly the Iron Curtain was created and we and the Russians became enemies. Note, some say that the animosity of the Cold War directly following World War II was only an outward smokescreen to justify the expenditure on both sides for massive nuclear armament buildups, and more importantly for massive black budget projects in space and underground, and that in reality topped the United States and use. Senior officials met regularly via secret submarine meetings that took place below the North Polar Ice Pack. This cooperation however was not complete as there were still many at the higher levels of the United States government who were against the military imperialist abuses of the communist system, and many at the highest levels of the U.S. senior who were against the corporate imperialist abuses of the capitalist system. Inner Earth researcher Dennis Crenshaw has written an interesting essay on the Rockefeller influence behind Admiral Byrd's missions to the Antarctic, stating that the Rockefellers had funded many of Byrd's missions. Could we imply from this that, following the war, the Rockefellers were able to reign in many of the lower-ranking Nazis yet many of the higher-ranking Nazis slipped out of their control? The corporate elite who backed the Nazis apparently did not want the products of their investments off doing their own thing. Apparently the Antarctic bases, like the Russian invasion, were not part of the Rockefellers' plan. However there are suggestions that the Rockefeller-backed Nazis in America have since made contact with their comrades in Antarctica and have agreed to work together 
along with the Greys, in an effort to infiltrate America and pave the way for its fall and assimilation into a new world order. As we will see later, there are claims that some 1.5 million Nazis are now operating in various levels of American society. Just where did they come from? Antarctica? Physicist Vladimir Terzisky stated that the Nazi presence in Antarctica has passed the 2 million mark, and therefore Antarctica might conceivably be able to provide a large percentage of this infiltration force. Also remember that the American, European and Antarctican Nazis, due to the very secret society foundations of their movement, would have to maintain some level of contact with their occultist house in Bavaria, especially with the Thal and Vril societies. Branton. Both the Soviets and the United States ringed the Poles with defense and detection bases, and in between was the barren no man's land of the Poles where absolutely nobody lived, or did they? Could it be that we pretended we were protecting against the Russians and they pretended they were protecting against us, while really we and they were both scared of what was in between us, the Nazi last battalion? Rudolf Hess and secret German space base. Rudolf Hess, Hitler's best friend and second in command, went to England to try to stop the war with Britain and was arrested as a war criminal on May 10, 1941 and was kept from having any contact with the public until he was recently murdered. He was the only prisoner in Spandau prison. Ones who paid any attention to his situation at all have wondered what was the big secret he knew that made him so dangerous to the Allies? Perhaps the answer is revealed in Christoph Friedrich's book Secret Nazi Polar Expeditions on page 34. Hess was entrusted with the all-important Antarctic file. Hess, himself, kept the polar file. If you look at a map of Antarctica you will see that a portion of Queen Maud land is called Nushwebenland. Click image left. This is the part of the continent nearest to South Africa. The Germans made a major expedition to this area in 1938 to 1939 and began the construction of a major base. For details of this expedition, see the book by Friedrich. This book has pictures of the warm water geothermal, ponds and other information that will surprise you. It has maps showing that Admiral Byrd's Operation the Jump Naval Task Force 68 military invasion landed on the side opposite the German bases. The maps of Operation the Jump say that they left the German side of the continent unexplored. A man who was very influential in modern German post-war politics was Hans Ulrich Rudel, a frequent guest speaker in German military and political circles. Rudel was the man groomed by Hitler to become his successor. It is known that Rudel made frequent trips to Terra del Fugo at the tip of South America nearest Antarctica. One of Martin Bormann's last messages from the bunker in Berlin to Donitz mentioned Terra del Fugo. A book called America's Aircraft Yearbook tells about the, the United States using captured German scientists at Fort Bliss and Wright Field. Among those in the German group at Wright Field were Rudolf Hermann, Alexander Lipsisch, Heinz Schmidt, Helmut Heinrich, and Fritz Dobelhoff and Ernst Kugel. Harman was attached to the Peenemünde Research Station for Aerodynamics, where Germany's V-2 rockets were hatched and launched against England. A specialist in supersonics, he was in charge of the supersonic wind tunnel at Kockel in the Bavarian Alps. He also was a member of the group entrusted with Hitler's futuristic plans to establish a space station rocket refueling base revolving as a satellite about the Earth at a distance of 4,000 miles a scheme which he and certain high-ranking off officers in 1937 still believed to be feasible. Later evidence shows that most or all of the aircraft and flying saucer scientists who were not captured, Branton, disappeared. The available evidence indicates they went to South America or Antarctica. The Elmer Curio and Der Weg papers told of a large submarine convoy discovered by the British Navy at the end of WW2. All available Allied units engaged the convoy and were totally destroyed except for the captain of one destroyer, who was reported as saying, May God help me, may I never again encounter such a force. On July 10, 1945, more than two months after the end of the war, the German submarine U-530 surrendered to Argentine authorities. The commander was Otto Wormout. The sub had a crew of 54 men, the normal sub crew was 18 men, and the cargo consisted of 540 barrels of cigarettes and unusually large stocks of food. The commander was 25 years old, the second officer was 22, and the crew was an average of 25 except for one man who was 32 years old. This was an unusually young crew and upon questioning it was learned that they all claimed that they had no relatives. A map from a Spanish book called, Is Hitler Alive? With the route of the fur convoy shows it passed alongside South Georgia Island, 
where later a secret underground base was the focus of a secret battle during the Falkland Islands War. On April 4, 1944 at 4.40 a.m. the German submarine U-859 left on a mysterious mission carrying 67 men and 33 tons of mercury sealed in glass bottles in watertight tin crates. The sub was sunk by a British submarine and most of the crew died. One survivor on his deathbed about 30 years later told about the expensive cargo and some divers checked out his story and found the mercury. For what purpose was this mercury to be used? And where were they trying to take it? Apparently mercury is theoretically usable as a fuel source for certain forms of aerospace propulsion. Branton, there are many other stories of other U-boats and German survivors, mostly in the southern hemisphere. The Germans and other European nations required very meticulous registration records of everybody, including their relatives, employment, addresses, children, etc., and at the end of the war the Allies, cross-checking these records, taking into account casualties and deaths, determined that there were 80 at least 250,000 persons unaccounted for. That's a quarter of a million, by the way. Branton. German submarines in the South Atlantic. The newspaper Franz Sawyer had the following account, almost one dash one half years after cessation of hostilities in Europe, the Atlantic Icelandic. Whaler, Juliana, was stopped by a large German U-boat. The Juliana was in the Antarctic region around Malvinas, now Falkland, Islands when a German submarine surfaced and raised the German official naval flag of mourning, red with a black edge. The submarine commander sent out a boarding party, which approached the Juliana in a rubber dinghy, and having boarded the whaler demanded of Captain Hecla part of his fresh food stocks. The request was made in the definite tone of an order to which resistance would have been unwise. The German officer spoke a correct English and paid for his provisions in the United States dollars, giving the captain a bonus of $10 for each member of the Juliana crew. Whilst the foodstuffs were being transferred to the submarine, the submarine commander informed Captain Heckler of the exact location of a large school of whales. Later the Juliana found the school of whales were designated. The French, Agence France Press, on the 25th of September 1946, said, the continuous rumors about German U-boat activity in the region of Terra del Fugo, Fjordland, in German, between the southernmost tip of Latin America and the continent of Antarctica are based on true happenings. There have been stories and books written about Germans counterfeiting the United States currency and otherwise obtaining American money printing plates, which may account for the German use of American money. The Guinness Book of World Records says that the greatest unsolved robbery was the disappearance of the entire German treasury at the end of the war. Ramp Corporation. In January 1946 industrialist Donald Douglas approached the Army Air Force with a plan for government and industry to work together on long-range strategic planning. This was called Project Rand, a name coined by Arthur Raymond from Research and Development. Much of their first government money went to the Von Braun team. McDougall, Walter Al. The Heavens and the Earth, A Political History of the Space Age, Basic Books, New York, 1985, p. 89. Note, Rand Corporation was also involved in expanding some of the upper levels of the Dulce, New Mexico Underground Biogenetics Research Facility, according to Thomas Costello. Branton, German Flying Discs. Hitler's advanced technology included intercontinental ballistic missiles, vertical takeoff aircraft, jet engines, cruise missiles, sound cannons, and many other advanced items. The Allies captured plans for what became the Boeing 737 Jumbo Jet. Among the most secret items captured were plans for flying discs, that were at first called crowd meteors. Based on the evidence, they were built as early as around 1933 and went into mass production in 1940. Scientists involved in these projects were Belonzo, Schriever, Myth and Victor Schauberger. Schauberger developed the flying hat type disc that was later seen over the United States. The final version was the Balonzo Schriever Myoth Discus, as large as 135 feet and some up to 225 feet in diameter. They traveled over 2,000 kilometers slash hour and were planned to go over 4,000 kilometers slash hour. In 1945 they could reach a speed of 1,300 miles per hour and an altitude of 40,000 feet in less than three minutes. The Germans developed the Delta Wing craft and were working on stealth technology, etc. Many pilots saw the strange craft over Germany. However, as soon as the craft was built, Hitler ordered it disassembled and shipped somewhere, probably Antarctica. None of the craft were captured by the Allies, 
although some of the scientists were captured and then mostly disappeared, but could somewhat be traced to Bell Textron and to places such as Area 51, which, surprise, is infamous for its UFO sightings. Here are some examples of news items during WW2 concerning Germany's UFOs, from the New York Times, New York Times, December 14, 1944, Floating Mystery Ball is New German Weapon. Supreme Headquarters, Allied Expeditionary Force, December 13, a new German weapon has made its appearance on the Western Air Front, it was disclosed today. Airmen of the American Air Force report that they are encountering silver-colored spheres in the air over German territory. The spheres are encountered either singly or in clusters. Sometimes they are semi-translucent. And, Supreme Headquarters December 13, Reuters, the Germans have produced a secret weapon in keeping with the Christmas season. The new device, apparently an air defense weapon, resembles the huge glass balls that adorn Christmas trees. There was no information available as to what holds them up like stars in the sky, what is in them or what their purpose is supposed to be. Note, in regards to the above, Bulgarian physicist Vladimir Terziski wrote the following about the Nazi mystery spheres and aerial disk projects. According to Renato Vesco, Germany was sharing a great deal of the advances in weaponry with their allies the Italians during the war. At the Fayette Experimental Facility at Lake Garda, a facility that fittingly bore the name of Air Marshal Hermann Goering, the Italians were experimenting with numerous advanced weapons, rockets and airplanes, created in Germany. In a similar fashion, the Germans kept a close contact with the Japanese military establishment and were supplying it with many advanced weapons. I have discovered for example a photo of a copy of the manned version of the V-1, the Reichenberg, produced in Japan by Mitsubishi. The best fighter in the world, the push-pull twin propeller Domir 335 was duplicated at the Kawashima Works. Or a photo of Japanese high-ranking Imperial Navy officers inspecting the latest German radar station. A Japanese friend of mine in Los Angeles related to me the story of his friend's father, who worked as technician in an aircraft research bureau in Japan during the war. In July of 1945, two and a half months after the war ended in Germany, a huge German transport submarine brought to Japan the latest of German inventions, two spherical wingless flying devices. The Japanese R&D team put the machines together, following the German instructions, and there was something very bizarre and other earthy standing in front of them, a ball-shaped flying device without wings or propellers, that nobody knew how it flied. The fuel was added. The start button of this unmanned machine was pressed in it. Disappeared with a roar and flames without into the sky. The team never saw it again. The engineers were so frightened by the unexpected might of the machine, that they promptly dynamited the second prototype and chose to forget the whole incident. Branton. Falkland Islands War. The Falkland Islands War had more to do with Nazis Antarctica than with Argentina. The Germans, from their Antarctic base, began to infiltrate into Argentina, Chile, etc., and bought large tracts of land and swept up corporations. They also invested in corporations in Germany and elsewhere, with plans to make a comeback. They used the German treasury, captured treasure from other nations, and counterfeit American currency printed on real the United States currency printing plates given to the Russians and captured by the Germans. Note, it appears as if the German elite had begun to attempt to accomplish via stealth what they failed to do by force in World Wars II by infiltrating North and South America and engaging in economic warfare from their extensive underground black budget empire below Antarctica and also South and North America, with the help of their allies and the CIA slash NSA. We are not talking billions of dollars here, but trillions of dollars which have been siphoned from the, the United States economy via numerous ingenious methods, and used to feed the Bavarian-backed underground network which stretches throughout North America and which are inhabited by European. American and Antarctic and National Socialists. The wealth that has been siphoned from the American economy could otherwise have been used to prime the economy to new heights of prosperity, and that prosperity would have in turn overflowed into the other nations of the world. Apparently the Nazis realized this, and also realized that the banksters who had backed them during World War II had the real power. They understood that economic power ultimately dictated political power even in a supposedly democratic country where they could buy off political power from those who were more interested in immediate physical comforts and economic status rather than the long-term fate of their own country. The Nazis could not have done what they have done without the help of the traitors within. The same could be said for the Greys also.
Not to mention the CIA slash Nazi slash Grey collaboration itself existent within various underground bases, Neuschwabia, Antarctica. Pine Gap, Australia. Alsace Lorraine MTS. Germany. Montauk, Long Island. The Denver International Airport. Dulce, New Mexico. Area 51, Nevada, etc. Dash Brandon. Some plates were stolen by Assistant Secretary of the, the United States Treasury Harry Dexter White, real name Weiss, under Henry Morgenthau, and sent to the Soviets for use in occupied Germany. He also arranged for the mass theft of tons of our special money paper. When J. Edgar Hoover went to President Truman with all the evidence that the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury was a communist spy and thief, Truman of course removed Weiss White from his job and promoted him to head of the International Monetary Fund. I kid you not, look it up. This tells you whose side Truman was really on. Branton. The story has a rather common ending, when a controversy developed in the press concerning this incident. Weiss became a suicide. German economic miracle. For more information on how the economic miracle was accomplished after the war by the Germans, you can read such books as Martin Bormann, Nazi in Exile by Paul Manning. Bormann became the guiding force in the economic miracle that led to the rebirth of German industry and finance in the 35 years following political and military defeat. In the waning months of World War II, as the Third Reich was tottering and finally crumbling in defeat, Bormann set up 750 corporations scattered among those nations that had remained neutral. Those corporations received the fleeing wealth of Germany and became the power base that enabled Germany to climb back to economic and political strength. From Flyleaf this book expands on the meeting in Strasbourg on August 10, 1944, mentioned in Michael Barzahar's book, The Avengers. In 1986, while researching these subjects, we received 161 pages under a Freedom of Information search concerning what happened to the German Treasury at the end of WW2. Many of these documents had been secret until declassification to fulfill our request. One document was no. 19,489. November 27, 1944, Subject, Transmitting Intelligence Report No. UPA 198. Barely readable by G2 Economic Section, the Secretary of State, from Lt. Col. John W. Easton, Economic Warfare Division. The cover letter stated, I have the honor to enclose Intelligence Report No. UPA 198 by G2 Economic Section, Chef, Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Forces. Dated November 7, 1944, describing the plans of German industrialists for the post-war resurrection of Germany. Among the topics dealt with in this report are, patents, financial reserves, exportation of capital, and the strategic placing of technical personnel. It is obvious that Manning quoted from these documents in his book on Bormann. In describing the meeting of August 10, 1944, in Strasbourg, some sentences in the documents stand out, German industrialists must it was said, through their exports increase the strength of Germany. They must also prepare themselves to finance the Nazi party which would be forced to go underground as Mequi in Gieberverteidigungstellenja and from now on the government would allocate large sums to industrialists so that each could establish a secure post-war foundation in foreign countries. Existing financial reserves in foreign countries must be placed at the disposal of the party so that a strong German empire can be created after the defeat. It is also immediately required that the large factories in Germany create small technical offices or research bureaus which would be absolutely independent and have no known connection with the factory. These bureaus will receive plans and drawings of new weapons as well as documents which they need to continue their research and which must not be allowed to fall into the hands of the enemy. The last sentences in this document are, after the defeat of Germany the Nazi party recognizes that certain of its best known leaders will be condemned as war criminals. However, in cooperation with the industrialists it is arranging to place its less conspicuous but most important members in positions with various German factories as technical experts or members of its research and designing offices. Some of the documents were concerning looted gold, 1945 to 1948. Note, a massive shipment of gold which disappeared from an allied train which was dynamited in a rail tunnel was later used to finance such Thal Society-backed projects as the Montauk or Phoenix experiments as a means to counter the Navy's own Philadelphia or Rainbow experiments. The CIA itself delivered over into the hands of the Thulist Nazis much of the Philadelphia experiments research and technology. Branton. 
Accession number 56-75-101, Agency Container number 169, File number BIS-2-00. These documents concern Germany's looted gold being transferred to the Bank for International Settlements in Switzerland. One important paragraph, number 9, says, It is clear both from correspondence and from testimony that the management of the BIS during the war was in the hands of the Administration Council, in which the Axis representatives have an authoritative influence and that in 1942 the Germans favored the re-election of President Munkittrich, whose personal opinions they characterized as safely known. Note, it has been claimed by some researchers that the seven most powerful bankers in the world, who collectively control over 80% of all global financial transactions and over 60% of all global trade, have in the past met regularly at the Bank of International Settlements or single quote B. Eyes. Office in the Fighting Name Tower of Basel in Basel, Switzerland. Branton, enclosed in the file is a clipping from the New York Times, date not included but appears to be in 1945, that states, McKittrick slated for post AT chase. He will take over duties as Vice President of Bank here next autumn. Thomas H. McKittrick, American banker who has served as President of the Bank for International Settlements BIS, since the beginning of 1940, will become a Vice President of the Rockefellers Chase National Bank of New York next fall, Winthrop W. Aldrich, Chairman of the Board of Chase, announced yesterday. The article ends by quoting McKittrick, I realize it is my duty to perform a neutral task in wartime. It is an extremely difficult and trying thing to do, but I'll do the best I can. Another formerly top secret document declassified was, subject, conversation in Switzerland with Mr. McKittrick, President of the Bank for International Settlements, from Arvis A. Schmidt to Secretary of the Treasury Morgenthau, dated March 23, 1945. It describes McKittrick's dealings with the real head of the Nazi banking system, a vice president named Paul. Paul was described by McKittrick as a career banker who had been with the Reichsbank for some 20 years, who does not share the Nazi point of view. The Swiss National Bank said that in order to be sure they were not obtaining looted gold they had requested a member of the Reichsbank, whom they regarded to be trustworthy, to certify that each parcel of gold which they purchased had not been looted. The person who had done this certifying was Paul. Paul was Reichsbank Senior Vice President Emil Johann Rudolf Paul. He was in charge of taking booty into the bank and was in charge of it for the Nazis. His senior shipping clerk Albert Thoms said that they needed up to 30 men to help him sort and repack the valuables, which consisted of millions in gold marks, pounds sterling, dollars and Swiss francs, 3,500 ounces of platinum, over 550,000 ounces of gold, and 4,638 carats in diamonds and other precious stones, as well as hundreds of pieces of works of art. P. 226, Aftermath, Laudilla's Farrago, Avon, 1974. This material was shipped out of the country in Operation Firelund or Auction Fuhrland in German, which Farrago explained in a footnote in his book on Bormann. The transaction was named Land of Fire after the archipelago of Tiradelfugo at the southern extremity of Argentina and Chile, the area to which some of the shipments were originally consigned. p. 228. On the next page Farrago said, only a relatively small portion of the SS treasure was impounded by Bormann and sent overseas in the course of action Führerland. Much of it is still missing. Germany had developed self-sufficiency before the end of the war, and was manufacturing their own oil, produced butter from coal, invented powdered milk, developed freeze-drying, learned to store flour indefinitely, were growing their food in greenhouses on chemical soil, etc. These projects were also necessary for survival of the secret UFO force which Hitler called the last battalion, at the Antarctic. The counterfeiting of British and American money was under Operation Bernhard. The fake British notes have been often discussed in books and articles about Bernhard, but the fake American currency is not as well known. Recently though the United States announced that it was issuing new money to counteract the counterfeit, which was said to be coming from Saddam Hussein in Lebanon. It would be more correct to say it is coming from South America, but that money is supposed to all be drug money. Life gets complicated. When Contact newspaper first ran the series on Fire from the Sky, it followed with a reprint of the information about the truth about the Falkland Islands War. In that series, it revealed that the Russians, working with Rockefeller forces, defeated the British Bolshevik forces on South Georgia Island. If you have not read that series, read them here, this information may not make sense to you.
It is important to know that information, if you intend to try to understand what is happening. Nazi forces were involved in the Falkland Islands War, on the side of the Russians. This is hard to believe if you had no idea of what is. The Russians were nationalists, as opposed to the Bolsheviks who took their country away from them. The so-called Bolsheviks were trained in the Lower East Side of New York City and financed by New York and London bankers. Over 200 were trained to operate as the first Politburo and taught the communist philosophy in New York by the Rockefellers. Branton, they invaded Russia, killed the Tsar and many nationalists and took over the government. Can you begin to see how someone like Boris Pash, with a Russian nationalist family background, could work with Nazi Gestapo and SS agents? In 1982, on April 20th, Hitler's birthday, the Russian slash Rockefeller slash Nazi commando force broke through and inserted a neutron bomb into the underground naval base at South Georgia Island. Note, as suggested earlier, the Rockefellers had originally backed the Bolsheviks and the Nazis. Later they began backing the Russian nationalists and the Nazis after the Bolsheviks were kicked out of Russia and wormed their way into the Pentagon from where they planned a global nuclear holocaust which they would ride out in their underground bunkers. This is where the Rockefellers and Bolsheviks came into disagreement, as the Rockefellers resisted the apocalyptic plans of the ousted Bolsheviks because they were not financially profitable. A nuclear war would most likely result in a global economic collapse as well, something that the Rockefellers did not want. It would seem that the Rockefellers are opportunists. Now that the Russian nationalists had once again gained control of Russia, the Rockefeller Nazi alliance embraced their nationalist brothers who held the power. If only the nationalists knew who created their Bolshevik enemies in the first place. The Rockefeller corporate empire is a chameleon, changing its colors to fit the current circumstances. Branton. Alexander Haig was the general representing the Rockefellers. In his book Caveat, the chapter on the Falklands starts, on March 28, 1982, a Sunday, the British ambassador. Nicholas Nico Henderson brought me a letter from Lord Carrington. A party of Argentinians, Argentina, where the Nazis had a major presence in addition to Antarctica. Branton, wrote the Foreign Secretary, had landed nine days earlier on the island of South Georgia, a British Navy possession lying in the South Atlantic a few degrees above the Antarctic Circle and some 600 miles to the east of the Falkland Islands, a British Crown colony. I'll bet you thought the Falkland Islands war was about the Falkland Islands. Much ado was made in the media about the conflict between Jean Kirkpatrick and Alexander Haig. Kirkpatrick is a Zionist and was the, the United States ambassador to the United Nations. She has a regular feature column in the Jewish Press newspaper, the largest independent Anglo-Jewish weekly newspaper. Haig has had a long relationship with Henry Kissinger, to whom Haig became senior military advisor in 1969. Remember that Kissinger came out of the pro-Nazi paperclip operation personnel. In January 1982, Reagan replaced his national security advisor, Richard Allen, with William P. Clark, another paperclip person, and who was Haig's deputy. Nixon said, when you see the lights burning late in Henry's Kissinger office, it's usually Al Haig. War in the Falklands, the full story by the Sunday Times of London Insight Team, Harper and Row, New York, 1982, p. 123. If you doubt the fact that the Nazis never gave up and that they planned to continue the war after their defeat in Germany, and planned to make a comeback to finally achieve their goal, then perhaps you should read the following books, Dash Dash Connell, Brian, A Watcher on the Rhine, William Morrow and Company, New York, 1957. Old Wine in New Bottles, How the Nazis Have Come Back into Power. Dash Dash Horn, Alastair, Return to Power, Frederick A. Brigger, Incorporated, New York. 1956. The struggle for unification, rather than any revival of Nazism, may one day force Germany out of the Western camp. Tetons, T.H., The New Germany and the Old Nazis, Random House, New York, 1961. A frank and often shocking account which details how Hitler's own had managed to return to power in almost every walk of German life. Dash Dash Winkler, Paul, The Thousand Year Conspiracy, Charles Scribner's Sons, 1943. Secret Germany Behind the Mask. Dash Dash White, Theodore H., Fire in the Ashes, William Sloan Associates, New York, 1953. The Fire of Nazism in the Ashes of Europe. Dash Dash Sayers, Michael and Con, Albert E., The Plot Against the Peace, Book Find Club, New York, 
1945. Uncovers Nazi Germany's secret plans for a third world war. After all, they more or less got the first two world wars going, didn't they? Branton. Dash Dash Schultz, Sigrid, Germany will try IT again, Reynolds and Hitchcock, New York, 1944. Does the title give you a clue? Dash Dash Darnberg, John, Schizophrenic Germany, Macmillan Company, New York, 1961. Is the new West Germany of the post-war years as democratic as we have been led to believe, or does Nazism still smolder? Dash Dash Lord Russell, Brigadier, of Liverpool, CBE, Mc. Return of the Swastika? David McKay Company, New York, 1969. Russell was part of the Nuremberg prosecution team. Dash Dash Sutton, Anthony C., Wall Street and the Rise of Hitler, single quote 76 Press, Seal Beach, California, 1976. There are more, these just happen to be the ones in my personal library. I read them, mostly about 20 or 30 years ago. I do not mean to give the impression that Germany is the source of the world's problems. Germany has simply been a part of a much bigger picture. Sam Russell's Open Mind Forum Program. More information on the Nazi Antarctic efforts and their attempts to impose a global dictatorship comes from Bulgarian physicist Vladimir Terziski. The following interview between talk show host Sam Russell and Terziski took place between 8 to 10 p.m., June 5, 1993 on Sam Russell's Open Mind Forum Program. KTKK, K-Talk, Radio in Salt Lake City, Utah. We will quote only those portions of the extensive conversation which tie in directly with the subject at hand. Note, some of the spellings of the names mentioned in the interview were transcribed phonetically from the tape. Actual spellings of these names which are identified as such may be different than they appear in the transcript, due perhaps in part to Mr. Terziski's Bulgarian accent, Sam Russell. I guess a place to start here. The Germans during World War II evidently had what was called the Foo Fighter, and this I guess is the name that the Allied pilots gave to this curious looking thing that would bob and weave and run around through the squadrons as they were flying over Germany to bomb and saw when dot Vladimir Terziski, exactly, the Foo Fighter, the fiery ball. Foo is fire in French, it's also wind in Japanese. By the way Renato Vesco, who was the Italian counterpart of Werner von Braun, the research scientist in charge of the Italian Air Force and Space Research and Development Program during the war, in his highly suppressed book in this country, which is also available through our academy, Intercept But Don't Shoot, talks about the whole family of turbo jet saucers that were built by the Germans, all the way up to the Foo Fighter, the Kugelblitz and the Feuerball, two different models of basically the same device. And he also mentions a lot of attacks of these machines on enemy bomber formations with devastating results for the bombers. Some of the Foo Fighters were doing 2,900 kilometers an hour and up. A bomber would do maybe 300, 400, 500 at the most. So we were talking about 6, 7, 8 times the bomber speed. The most interesting thing that has not come up into, let's say, the work of Renato Vesco because he talks only about the turbojet family of saucers. Basically very simple saucers made with piston engines with propellers, spinning the lenticular airframe the lens-shaped airframe of the craft thus creating gyroscopic intergravity, and some of them were hybrids between helicopters with spinning rotor, basically aerodynamic lift, and the gyroscopic lift of the spinning heavy massive rotary engines. I wouldn't be amazed if the rotary engine itself were created to power a gyroscopically spinning saucer that had a big helicopter propeller on top, so it's kind of a hybrid between a helicopter and a saucer. I even discovered extremely rare drawings by the genius of German aviation, Lippisch, the guy who built the first supersonic glider in a single quote 30s and it is not Chuck Yeager who broke the sound barrier, but probably the Germans 10 years earlier were there. Supersonic gliders that Lippisch built. Anyway, Lippisch was designing at the end of the war a supersonic ramjet propulsion craft with anti-gravity assists. They had the fuel tanks spinning inside the jets. Going through the engine part of the object to the engine duct, spinning the fuel around thus creating additional anti-gravity lift and greatly improving the lift capabilities and the inertial responses of the craft. So to sum it up in a nutshell, I have several very brilliant videos with dozens of photographs and engineering drawings, sketches and so on. The Germans had probably 50 models of flying saucers powered by every existing engine in their arsenal. Piston engines with propellers, rotary engines with propellers, Inboard and outboard turbojets, pulse jets, ram jets, and rocket engines. 
the rocket engine craft could go into orbit, the bigger models could go to the moon and back with literally a truckload of kerosene and oxygen. On top of the saucer space flights the Germans had an extensive space program with rocketry. I discovered just several days ago the man-made winged version of the V-2 rocket was doing suborbital flights with an altitude higher than the altitude of the Mercury, the Vostok, space capsules. They had space programs with their Zangerbrand stratospheric ramjet, bomber, antipodal, basically circling three quarters of the globe trajectory. That was the grandfather of the Aurora craft that is rumored so much these days in Area 51. Take note that both the American and Russian space programs depended on the German scientists they had both acquired following World War II. It is possible that these researchers were intentionally made out to be the cream of German aerospace science, when in fact the most intelligent scientists may have found their way to the Antarctic base following World War II, Branton. The aircraft industries of the Allies after the war had a difficult time duplicating and regurgitating the German designs that the Germans came up with. Senior, wow. That's amazing. Vermont, many of these things have not been duplicated yet, but the most astonishing photographs came, and I have copies of these and they are available, from the German secret society, Tali Gesellschaft, and the Templihof Gesellschaft, the German branch of the Knights Templars, which are also the international bankers so they have absolutely no problems financing these projects. Few of the dash indistinguishable dash lower ranking German scientists. Branton even knew that these projects were running. Many of them privately had been complaining that they were the dumbest fools because all the smart guys disappeared after the war into the German South Polar Underground Colony, and only basically the intelligent weaklings remained in Germany. We made a brilliant audio tape. By the way all of these things that we will be talking about are available in two dozen very good videotapes and about as many audio tapes. S. R. We will have to be sure and tell the folks how they can find out how to get a hold of those, okay? Vermont, it's very simple. They can call us here in Los Angeles at area code 310-473-9717. Senior. I'd like to ask a question about your knowledge of the Russian technologies. It is said that the Russians are really a lot further ahead than we are. Vermont, not at all. Senior, technologically.v.t. My feeling is that not only the French Revolution and the Paris Commune and the communism of Marx and Engels was financed and masterminded and orchestrated by the Bavarian Illuminati, but so was the Bolshevik Revolution, the Nazi uprising in Italy, or the National Socialist and Nazi movement in Germany. And along that line, Wall Street has secretly been going to painstaking efforts to help behind the scenes the Russians in order for them to become a real strong external enemy and not to be just a paper bear, a flimsy paper bear. I have numerous accounts of how the Germans built all the munitions plants, 14 out of 15 munitions plants before the war started, the Second World War started. They were all built by Germans. Rolls-Royce built the turbojet factory for the MiG fighter plane engines, just in time for the beginning of the Korean War. I have a photograph in my possession of the best at the time. Branton, American strategic bomber, the B-29, the one that dropped the bomb over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Under its wing there is hanging the best German twin-engine rocket interceptor, supersonic swept-wing rocket interceptor the DFS-336, and all of this under the red star markings of the Russian Air Force. How can somebody claim that there is not a secret siphoning of the most advanced technology behind the scenes of the Cold War in order to make Russia the real enemy? I've heard rumors that the Russians were given enriched uranium to build their first nuclear bomb, and when they couldn't do even that they were given a whole nuclear boom that was smuggled out in the luggage of the Russian ambassador straight on a flight from Washington to Moscow according to the words of Viktor Savaro, the genius of the Russian intelligence novels. And basically those are documentary books that he has written. The best of them is Aquarium. For any one of our listeners who would like to acquaint himself with the workings of a secret society. Later on the Russians were sold a nuclear submarine in order to make their sagging strategic fleet a more real, threatening menace. Why would the Bavarian Illuminati need a strong enemy in the Russians? Very simple, because otherwise they cannot keep the secrecy around these giant underground projects going on. Now the best reason they use is oh well, we cannot tell you about that, we cannot discuss this even in Congress because the Russians would know. It was cleverly used on both sides of the curtain in order for the Bavarian secret societies in both Russia and the United States to quietly engage in and justify the massive financing of these projects. Back to the Germans, 
the most interesting claim that they are making in another documentary film. Available from us, is that they landed on Mars in mid-January 1946 after eight months of heavy flight with a basically volunteer suicide crew of Germans and Japanese in a giant 230-foot diameter dreadnought. Again running on free energy, basically the Hans Kohler converters of gravity energy into electromagnetic energy of the flight. Another interesting thing that I found is a whole range of mind control experiments in Germany that were repeated verbatim by the superpowers after the war. Mind control with ultrasound, when they were inducing and indoctrinating their crack SS troops, mind control with all kinds of synthetic hallucinogenic drugs, or all kinds of the proper mushrooms, mind control that was developed using the Wilhelm Riken technology. In the initial states this involved types of sodomic mind control that was practiced by certain of the Aramanic and Luciferian orders of Tibetan monks that were visited by these numerous German ethnographic expeditions in the single quote twenties and single quote thirties, and all of this secret knowledge was later brought to Germany. We produce a fascinating tape here with Al Billick and T. Johnson from Las Vegas on the magical occult connections of the Third Reich, and we called the tape occult national shamanism and analogy to national socialism. A fascinating tape that basically brings together about a dozen extremely rare books on the occult connections of the Third Reich, the dabblings with Satanism, with witchcraft, with all kinds of unspeakable aberrations, including sexual aberrations. The Germans were in contact with half a dozen malevolent alien races in these big underground establishments. Some of these underground bases were two kilometers long, one kilometer wide. I have found the drawings of the tunnel systems with these bases from incredible places including the American Bombing Survey reports of underground, huge industrial establishments under the German mountains. The bottom line is that by the time the war ended the Germans were very heavily doing all these major parts of the Illuminati secret technologies on the planet. Were the Nazis the military research and development arm of the Bavarian Illuminati? Branton Mind Control Technologies, a whole dozen of mind control. I mean we have a tape here on mind control that was going on in the German bases. But the most important thing about their research was genetic engineering. Quite a well-known movie producer in Southern California that produced one of the best-known UFO documentaries that won a big award has mentioned to me in a private conversation that while researching for that film he saw in a military government archive a documentary, a silent documentary film about horrific genetic experiments on live human beings, I mean cutting off heads, dismembering, reassembling, human bodies from parts all these Frankensteinian experiments in the German genetic program. And finally the film culminated with footage of living, walking, breathing hybrids between humans and animals that were produced in German concentration camps half a century earlier. The Reef SPL Microscope, the Royal Reef Microscope which is rumored to be a Tesla scalar wave microscope that has an extremely high resolution power and can see many levels of complexity beyond the hierarchical level of the cell was probably the magical key to the human genome kingdom. The microscope was discovered in the single quote twenties in Berlin and probably gave the key to the Germans to the human genome. The big ten billion dollar human genome project that is right now beginning to drain budget dollars run through the Department of Energy here is nothing but a smokescreen for the real mastery of the human genome half a century earlier by the Illuminati that are running computerized designs of clones and human beings and all that stuff in the underground labs. Note. Bavarian cultists and gray aliens are reportedly working together in the production of so-called hybrids within the underground joint or operational facilities. Most of the hubrides, human hybrids, who are born with imputed reptilian DNA or DNA from other animals are the unwilling servants of the draconian collectivists from birth. Some of these people have escaped from the domination of the collective and have joined with more friendly federation forces or have been rescued by the same from captured bases or ships according to contact Alex Collier, and others. Branton. Senior, hmm.v.t. I take very seriously films, not only films like Boys from Brazil about the secret experiments in education of abducted children. The secret government has been the biggest consumer of abducted children in this country, and I called just on a hunch this mill carton 1-800 number, chasing a rumor that 400,000 children were missing from this country each year close to half a million each year. I thought nah, maybe 20, 30,000, it's not possible. And the lady there said, no, we don't have any statistics. Well, any newspaper articles, anything? No, no, we don't have anything. And I was beginning to get more and more suspicious. Finally she made an educated guess, 
having worked for five years in the system. She said, about maybe 200,000 children a year or so. Within only five minutes. Research I did, I got half of the wildest rumor that I've heard of, half a million missing every year. Most of them disappear in the underground. Of the New World Order. Station break. Senior, Vladimir Terziski. He is a UFO researcher. He is a co-founder with Al Billick of the American Academy of Dissident Scientists. Sam Russell takes a call at this point. The question is in regards to Vladimir's professional background. Vermont, well, I studied physics and engineering at Tokai University in Tokyo. I have a bachelor degree in physics and a master degree in electronics engineering. I worked for four years at the Solar Energy Research Institute for the Bulgarian Academy of Science before immigrating to the United States. I studied for three and a half, four years, sociology at Arizona State University and at UCLA, and I'm slowly dragging this additional degree of mine to a completion these days. Senior. Well, okay, let us move along and pick up on what you were talking about as we broke right there. This having to do with the genetic cloning and so on. V. T. I have two more items, basically very important items to finish and then we can go into the general discussions. To cap off the whole genetic research effort on the planet, it is not an idea of a few crazy Frankensteinian scientists here and there in the secret underground bases, it is not a crazy idea by the secret government or even by some high levels of alien races that are using us as convenient guinea pigs. It is a much higher level of party line agenda coming, my feeling is, from the Basically the fallen angelic presence on our planet that has been masterminding the conspiracy. Probably 90% of the alien races that have visited our planet. Most of them have been coming here on the planet subcontracting for that particular branch of the celestial management. And the biggest point on their agenda is, on top of advanced interstellar transportation and communication have been, the creation of life, or rather the recreation or rearrangement of existing biological matter since created beings whether standing or fallen can only restructure that what has already been created. Branton, and mind control of course. These have been the four extremely important points, the highest points on their agenda. So the creation of all of these Frankensteinian monsters is not an aberration of a sick mind or probably a latent Satanist movie producer. It is not a whim by some financier that is financing these projects. It is really an incredible saga on a universal or galactic level. These hierarchies that are trying to outdo and outbid each other and trying to prove to probably higher levels of celestial overseeing bodies that they can do a better management and a better creation of this and that including living beings. So I put the whole creation of artificial life from the crude mechanical robots created by the illuminational chemists, alchemists, in the medieval centuries to the Frankensteinian conglomeration of human beings from body parts in the late 19th century and the first creation of primitive clones in the early 20th century through the limited experiments of hybridization between humans and animals that were going on in German concentration camps during the war. And the biggest effort that was in front of the German hierarchy was the creation of the master race, the supermen. And what they did on a small scale in the concentration camps, later on in the late single quote 40s and early single quote 50s they did on a ten times bigger scale in their South Polar colony. The rumor is that these days there is a city called the New Berlin, a big underground city under the South Pole, south of South Africa in the Queen Wadland. Under the German jurisdiction, under the German nomenclature. A two million strong colony that engages primarily in space travel and human genetic engineering. And basically, a very careful analysis of the German technology, and I repeat I am not a religious freak, I entered into conspiracy theories only because of necessity to figure out the anti-gravity stuff that I was interested in. I'm primarily a physicist and an engineer, and I'm fascinated a lot more by an explanation of the physics of the local universe or of the energy management system in our grand universe than of, should we say, standing or fallen angelic management structures around our planet, but tracing the technologies, I have come to piece the big puzzle, this big galactic and universal puzzle together. Senior. We are just virtually out of time. Vladimir. We've had some questions off the air regarding what you might have available to send people in the written format or in electronic.v.t. I have a video list of probably 50 publications, videos, audios, booklets, articles and so on. Anyone who is interested can give us a call at area code 310-473-9717. And I will be soon in one of the bookstores in Salt Lake City.
I actually sent a lot of material that was exhibited at the Preparedness Expo show.s.r. We have to leave it there, Vladimir I appreciate very much your coming on, I know the notice was very short and I appreciate it. It's been a fascinating hour for me, I hope for our listeners as well, and I'll hope to do it again sometime. V.T. Sam, with the greatest of pleasure. I repeat again, this was only a little revelation of the working of the dark side. One should not be pessimistic, on the contrary just by shining the light on these ugly deeds of the Illuminati, that's all there needs to be done in order for them to start melting like an old snow under the hot summer rays. Senior, thank you very much Vladimir, a terrific way to end it. Note, Vladimir Terzisky is a Bulgarian-born engineer and physicist, graduated cum laude from the Master of Science program of Tokai University in Tokyo in 1980, served as a solar energy researcher, Bulgarian Academy of Sciences, before immigrating to the, the United States in 1984. He is also an international UFO researcher with command of English, Japanese, Russian, German, and Bulgarian, and creator-slash-lecturer of Ufology 101 course for university-level attendance. Branton. Attention, civil war is about to begin in the United States. You and your loved ones are in acute danger. Race riots and slaughter of Americans will be the first sign. This is no joke. On July 4, 1992, at a UFO convention in Arcadia, California, Mr. Michael Younger, a member of the super-secret COM-12 group and a scientist who worked at Groom Lake, Area 51 in Nevada, stunned the audience of over 200 people with the following incredible information, which, if true, endangers the lives and freedoms of every American. Here is the amazing scenario of the planned events, beginning in August of this year, 1992, a conspiracy long at work behind the scenes of our government, will make its first overt move. These conspirators plan to create a dictatorship in the United States, suspend our Constitution, and attempt to confiscate all guns and firearms in American homes. Stage 1 being to create race riots in major the United States cities such as New York, Chicago, Detroit, etc. These to begin in August. This will be preceded by a month of subliminal programming via TV and other media to condition the people for civil war in the United States. The accent will be on rap records such as Body Count released by Time Warner, a Rockefeller Corporation, by musicians Ice-T and Sister Soul, whose lyrics in such songs as Cop Killers are designed to inflame and polarize its listeners. These rap songs contain such lines as Kill White Policeman, Kill the Pigs, Kill Whitey, and Why Not Kill Whitey? if he can kill us, etc. In August Stage 2, codenamed Operation Hot August Nights, will take effect. Special agents of the conspiracy, masquerading as police, will open fire on minorities, namely black Americans and Hispanics and Orientals. Other agents will set off incendiary bombs as they did recently in the Los Angeles riots, which essentially was a test case that surpassed the expectations of the conspirators. These special agents, masquerading as police, massacre these blacks and minorities and fire at the real policemen. This brings in more police and the riots escalate. Skinheads and other gangs, already fully armed, join in the fray. The real police, vastly outnumbered, cannot handle the rioting. The National Guard is called in and fired upon by other special agents masquerading as gang members, who also enlist other gang members to fight the police and National Guardsmen. These riots continue through August with many minority Americans slaughtered in major cities. Note, although this did not come off as planned in August, possibly because the project had been compromised, the globalist plans are still in effect, even if they have experienced temporary postponement or setback. Also, a growing number of reports of United Nations military equipment being seen passing through the United States communities on trains, trucks, etc., have been surfacing in recent years. I personally have learned of a few related incidents. I have come across reports of National Guardsmen undergoing specialized house-to-house -house search and seizure training and urban warfare tactics. I was also told that two men who managed to sneak into a federal military plane graveyard outside of Phoenix, Arizona had came across several freight train box cars in which they discovered what they estimated to be from two to three million brand new shackles that were apparently being stored there, just waiting to be used. Keep this in mind while reading the following references to potential UN involvement in the attempted takeover.
Compare this with various implications concerning national and communist socialist control of the UN. Could the reason why the commies and Nazis get along together within the UN be due to the fact that they are both backed by the Bavarian Rockefeller Alliance? Could it be that the Louisiana riots, which began on April 29, 1992, were a test run for a plan to incite race riots and a civil race war in the United States? This is suggested by the following quotes from researcher Val Valerian during the UFO Expo West 92 in Los Angeles, which took place a week after the riots in Los Angeles, I chanced to run into some fellow investigators who had observed several ships loaded with electronic antennae off the coast of Los Angeles two days before the riots took place. There are groups in Southern California that regularly conduct frequency analysis of various metropolitan areas, and they reported that the Los Angeles area was heavily dosed with beta frequencies shortly before the riots occurred. Beta frequencies can produce anxiety states, and this most certainly exacerbated another scenario, which was a controlled exercise and population manipulation. On April 30th, the Compton Police Department revealed that it had arrested six people for arson, and that when questioned about their activities, the youths said they were on a mission to burn down ten buildings an hour. Their car contained ten gallons of gasoline for use in these fire bombing operations. Law enforcement sources also report that many of those arrested during the disturbance had identical cover stories, indicating that there were many such groups under the coordination and control of someone. The Los Angeles riots were in fact intelligence agency operations that were used to invoke the application of military troops. They were an attempt to start nationwide riots that would require the invocation of martial law and FEMA plans. Another indicator that the riots were probably an intelligence operation is that the day before the Rodney King verdicts were released, a mass leaflet was distributed in South Central Los Angeles by a group calling itself the Revolutionary Communist Party. If you are at all familiar with U.S. intelligence agency practices, it can immediately be seen that RCP is a front for CIA activities. Most revolutionary and terrorist activities are in fact performed by the very intelligence agencies which claim to exist for the prevention of such activities. The leaflet said, there's no justice in the courtroom, it's right to revel. Within days of the incident, Los Angeles Mayor Tom Bradley, who is also a member of the Trilateral Commission, folks used the press orchestrated clamor for police reform to put TLC counterinsurgency apparatus in place which launched a virtual war on local law enforcement effectively paralyzing, if not destroying, those functions. TLC member Tom Bradley, as it turns out, appointed fellow TLC member Warren Christopher to form the Independent Commission to investigate the LAPD. Christopher, whose specialty is riots and urban insurgency, is a partner in the law firm of O'Melveny and Myers. In the early 1960s, he and fellow TLC member Cyrus Vance, then at the Pentagon, drafted Operation Garden Plot a plan for military martial law in American cities in the event of domestic civil disorder. Of course, there's no distinction made of the cause of domestic disorder, if you get my point. Warren Christopher, in fact, was one of the creators of the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration law during the Johnson administration, when he was Deputy Attorney General. Law was one of the early attempts to implement a top-down federal takeover of local police departments and though the United States it is apparently a long-standing policy of the Trilateral Commission to foment civil disturbance and unrest, not just in the United States but worldwide, in order to foster the imposition of world dictatorship. Don't stop now, it gets more interesting. Also appointed to the Christopher Commission by TLC member Tom Bradley, Mayor of Los Angeles, is a man by the name of Mickey Cantor who just happens to be the national campaign manager for the Democratic presidential candidate and TLC member William Clinton, who is himself at the heart of the drug smuggling operation that was detailed on April 21, 1992 on NBC television's A Current Affair. Drugs have been flown in and out of the airport in Mena, Arkansas since the early Reagan days, and according to the television broadcast, both Bush and Clinton are aware of it. Every time there is an effort to look into it, the investigation gets stonewalled by the federal government. Check it out for yourself. Branton. Stage 3. In September, President Bush calls in United Nations troops to quash the riots and restore law and order. American troops had indicated they did not wish to fight against American civilians. Bush executes executive orders, already in effect, which now give the UN forces complete rights and freedom to enter American homes, to confiscate all devices that are capable of communicating information, which includes video cameras. VCRS, computers, mimeographs, 
anything that can print, copy machines, etc. These troops are furnished certain lists of names, particularly those known as patriots, and these patriots and their families are rounded up first, and if not executed on the spot, are sent to any of the 13 major concentration camps now fully activated in the United States. There is nobody left to tell what really happened. Curious neighbors will be told it was a justified drug raid. Those who escape to the hills and mountains are hunted down by search and destroy troops, specially trained for mountain warfare. During September our borders will be closed down, as well as airports. No one is allowed to leave the United States. Stage 4, in October an official announcement will be carried live on TV, that extraterrestrial aliens, probably Zeta Reticuli Greys, have invaded the Earth, with some actual aliens revealed on the show. This is actually a fake invasion. The aliens have been on Earth for many years, and made treaties and agreements with our governments. There are millions of them in secret underground complexes such as Dulce, New Mexico, which are responsible for the abduction of American children and citizens and the cattle mutilations documented in books and on TV, such as the recent special intruders. This announcement will cause the entire world to mobilize under UN supervision to fight the invaders. Note. Just as we mobilized under the UN to fight the communists in the pre-planned Korean War, when in fact the pro-socialist UN officials were already in league with the communists and were betraying our troop movements and plans to the Reds at every turn, according to General Douglas MacArthur. Incidentally the General's comments regarding this betrayal have mysteriously remained out of the official mainstream historical texts. MacArthur, by the way, was an advocate of the belief that the Third World War would involve a space war with aliens in our skies. Could an interplanetary version of this Machiavellian scenario be in the works, with the New World Order taking the place of the United Nations, and the alien greys taking the place of the Communists? An interesting thing about Michael Younger himself is that others have confirmed the existence of COM-12 and a similar agency called the Cabal. These two Navy intelligence agencies are aware of the presence of the Grace and are opposed to any further dealings with them based on known betrayals of established treaties. COM-12 and the Cabal are involved in an intelligence war with two fascist agencies connected to the NSA CIA known as Magi and Aquarius. These two agencies maintain active interactions with the Grey aliens and according to some these agencies are actually controlled by these entities via mind control implants. Take careful note of the fascist or Nazi origins of both the CIA and NSA as Trojan Horse or Fifth Column agencies in American intelligence. COM-12 and the Cabal are working with humanoid ETs who are determined to prevent the reptiloid ETs working through Magi and Aquarius from interfering with the affairs of this planet. The conflict between these two ET groups has apparently led to planet Earth being the center of an ancient dispute between these two galactic superpowers, the humanoid non-interventionists of the Pleiades Andromeda constellations and the reptiloid interventionists of the Orion Draconis constellations. COM-12 and the Cabal are determined to maintain American independence under the, the United States Constitution, whereas Magi and Aquarius are determined to betray America to the New World Order. COM-12 and the Cabal are intentionally leaking information damaging to Magi and Aquarius to the public, and it may have been due to their efforts that the Louisiana riots takeover scenario failed to materialize into a national emergency and a New World Order takeover at that time. The New World Order advocates have tried several times in the past and will continue to do so in the future. For some reason they are desperate to bring about the New World Order takeover of the United States of America by the year 2000. That is definitely their goal. If all else fails they may attempt an all-out United Nations invasion of the, the United States, using whatever possible means they can to justify such a UN operation. Branton, during November the chaos continues and more UN troops pour into the United States, mostly mercenaries who have fought in African nations and other hot spots previously. The butchery of these troops is well documented. Stage 5, in December a well-planned crash of the stock market will occur a dramatic drop to at least 1500 on the DJ industrial average. This event is planned to further weaken, panic and confuse the population. Stage 6 The Constitution of the United States is suspended and the people are now living under martial law in a totally fascist state. Who are these conspirators? According to Mike Younger, at the end of World War II, Nelson Rockefeller brought 3000 high Nazi party officials from Germany illegally into the, the United States, without permission. As of today it is believed there are now 1.6 million Nazis in the, the United States, many high in government and major corporations, 
such as Atlantic Richfield in New Jersey. Incredibly, these Nazi fascists are attempting to set up a Fourth Reich to continue the thousand-year plan of Adolf Hitler, with its intent to eventually eliminate non-Aryan people such as Jews, blacks and other dissidents. In January, 2000, when the real alien invasion occurs, the planet will be officially turned over to the alien invaders, the Nazi rulers expecting to get 25% of the Earth for themselves. The writers of this document did not originate the above material, but are simply passing this information along to you to do with what you feel is necessary. We have no way of knowing that these things will happen, we hope and pray they do not, but if any of the above should occur, you can rest assured the balance of this evil scenario will follow. Their two main immediate goals are to disarm American citizens and suspend our Constitution. Mind control projects out of Atlantic. UFO Nazi October Surprise. More information from the Arcadia, California conference which featured Michael Younger, a member of the secret Navy Intelligence Unit COM-12, which is attempting to maintain a rearguard defense of the, the United States Constitution, Bill of Rights and Declaration of Independence. Branton. Many of these Nazis became agents of the Central Intelligence Agency, CIA, NASA, also in SA, and in the FBI and other government agencies, so that the Nazis had more or less totally infiltrated the United States government in many of the most key and sensitive positions. They also were used in and given jobs within many of the corporations owned by the Rockefellers, including Atlantic Richfield. It was through Atlantic Richfield that much of the mind control programs were implemented and used. One of the Nazis' doctors, working with 300 elite scientists on these projects, developed a certain drug that could be used on children, inducing severe pain and torture, where the child would normally black out and become unconscious. The doctor could administer or inject the drug and it would keep the child from blacking out, and thus the doctor could then inflict greater pain, going far beyond the threshold of human endurance, which in turn would allow the mind of the child to become totally wiped out. A total blank so that the child forgot identity, forgot personal identity, forgot even how to add or subtract or carry on conversation. Mind controlled children used as sex slaves. The child would need to be totally programmed from the beginning, starting from a blank consciousness. This technique of brainwashing or mind control allowed them to create whatever kind of person they wanted. They created many of these children to become sex slaves for their own kind and those children then became used by others for as long as they were wanted, to be disposed of when the person was tired of them or finished with them. According to this, Michael Younger's tape, the man responsible for distributing the children among various Nazis for sex use was named Larry King, not the Larry King of the television and talk show host, but a younger man, a different person, who would barter in human souls and sell these children to men for sex purposes, for parties or for whatever allowing them total ownership of the child as though the child were simply an object. The Nazis were free to destroy the child or to keep the child. Some of the children were used for satanic purposes according to the tape. They were used for satanic rituals which, in some of the rituals, included being skinned alive and having a heart pulled out of the child while the child is still living. This, Larry King would sell these children, making huge amounts of money for these various purposes, and if the children did not work out, they were simply disposed of. In many cases, if they were brought back to be disposed of, they would be sent to the Atlantic Richfield Complex in New Jersey and the complex would work with the children to try to salvage them. Reinforce a state of mindless automatic obedience Atlantic Richfield Complex scene of mass child murders and burials. If this did not work they were simply taken out into the back area and shot and put into a trench which had been dug by a bulldozer and the bulldozer would then move dirt over them. The mill carton kids and what the Nazis are doing to them. Joseph Mengele, Hitler's evil doctor is alive and well, Mike Younger discussed. What is termed the mill carton kids, the disappearing children of this nation whose faces appear on mill cartons. Many of these children have been abducted by Nazis and the tape speaks in particular of a program. Which is directed toward mind control. Joseph Mengele, the Nazi doctor that worked most closely with Adolf Hitler, was not yet dead as reports have indicated. Dr. Mengele was still operating a mind control center in Florida, which specialized in manipulating the minds of children. The idea of dealing with children fascinated the Nazis because their minds were already easily controlled and easier to alter than were adults. Plus, they had the ability to control them with greater ease because of size, and also they had the ability to use a mind-controlled child according to the way they wished. Mike Younger, speaking of this, 
told of how he and his lawyer had infiltrated the Nazi groups and had gone to the New Jersey Atlantic Richfield Arco complex to a meeting of Nazis and throughout the day they kept hearing intermittent shots. Note, the Brookhaven National Laboratories which assisted in the Montauk projects is also located in New Jersey, and there is also a strong neo-Nazi or white supremacist political movement active in this area as well. In addition to this, the Standard Exxon Oil Company which during World War II established a merger with the Nazi company IG Farben, which utilized slave labor, is also based in New Jersey. Not to mention the ITT complex in New Jersey as well, which is owned and controlled largely by the German Krupp family. Those patriots who are native to that area should keep on the lookout for any leads on Nazi activity there and, once they have discovered signs of such activity they should cautiously investigate, document, and expose it for all to see. Branton. They did not know what those shots were until they were taken to another place overlooking the site of the complex and they saw the children being taken out, forced to kneel down by the trench and shot in the back of the head with .22 pistols. After three or four would be shot, the bulldozer would move forward a few feet, covering them, and then the process would begin again. Each time a few would be shot and fall into the trench, and the bulldozer would move dirt over them. Michael Younger speaking to a group of approximately 200 or so people in Arcadia, explained all of this. The lawyer who had accompanied him became so frightened of the story and of the events that he decided himself not to talk in person. The next day when he was scheduled to speak he did not, but instead to present a videotape. He was convinced that if he showed up there, he would be killed. This man, being Jewish. The Jewish attorney decided that he would be killed if he showed up there and thus, left instead a videotape describing this incident and the treatment of the children who had disappeared. The term milk carton kids was a derogative term used as a joke by these Nazis because they never returned and they thought this was a rather funny way of describing the kids. The fact that their pictures were put on milk cartons did not help the children, but the Nazis did believe it showed some kind of effort by the society, which had been lacking previously. They did not admire the fact that an effort was being made to locate the children. But they thought it was a joke to have their faces plastered on milk cartons, when they would never be seen again. During the presentation in Arcadia, a film was shown in which the United Nations armies were brought into a West African nation to bring peace. They encountered several hundred civilians, and thus opened fire on them with machine guns and rifles. Vividly shown in the film was one lady carrying her child. The head of the child suddenly exploded as a .30 caliber machine gun bullet blew it open like it was a watermelon and then another bullet struck the mother and she fell down. The masses, the several hundred women and children eventually were all slaughtered by the United Nations troops who had come to bring peace, and they joked and laughed about their job and how they had completed that and now must get on and find others. The film itself had been brought back to be put on television to alert the masses but no station would allow it to be shown, and thus, the film was presented at this meeting and was made available for individuals to purchase. But such does not allow the masses to know what really occurs with these mercenary United Nations troops. There were several hundred people present. When someone asked, does George Bush know he's a target for assassination in March? The answer was, he does now. He knows that his vice president is behind it. Note, one source has stated that George Bush was the former director of a secret government group which wields even more power than the CIA. That is the MJ-12 or Pi-40 organization, which is an extension of Magi. When Bush left the position, Dan Quayle reportedly took over, in which case Quayle would have been at the time one of the most powerful individuals in the secret government power structure, if this source was accurate. There are incidentally reports that MJ-12 itself is currently fragmented between the pro-Grey advocates in Magi slash Aquarius agencies and the anti-Grey activists in the Cabal slash COM-12 agencies. Branton. Mike Younger also indicated that there were further efforts on their part to prevent this plan from being carried out. The people whom he works with have been working to expose George Bush and his iran slash contra connections and his dealings with his brother in illegal operations in Japan, in hopes that these things will eventually cause enough people to question him and not vote for him. There are quite a number of these agents, like Michael Younger and others connected to COM-12, Branton working to try to bring intelligence agents over to the good side and trying to bring military leaders over to the good side, and that there are quite a few people within the intelligence and military groups who know what is going on, and who simply don't like it, and that they are preparing their own plans to counter this plan if it is indeed carried off. Note, apparently these campaigns were successful, 
as George Bush failed in his bid for re-election. If he would have been re-elected, could it be that we would now be living in a fascist dictatorship? It should also be realized that George Bush is not the center of the conspiracy, the new agenda would go on with or without him. He was actually at the time a front man for a force that is far more evil and more powerful than any one man alone. Neither am I implying that the nations of Germany, Austria nor Italy, where the Bavarian Roman secret societies have their roots are the ultimate enemy. The enemy is the secret society power structure itself, which controls the governments of these countries, and the means of counterattack should be a blatant, focused and unrelenting exposure of the deepest and darkest secrets, atrocities and where crimes of these death merchants. Branton. Today, another opportunity has been presented and since these forces can no longer polarize the West against Russia, trigger a devastating nuclear war, at least not with Russia, unless it becomes a superpower once again, it has seized upon the present opportunity wherein economic depression and a growing polarizing in America against minorities, can create such dire conditions in America that the public will actually allow the President to call in UN troops to restore law and order. An interesting confirmation of some of the above appears in Webster Griffin Tarpley and Anton Chaikin book, George Bush, The Unauthorized Biography, which was first serialized in The New Federalist, beginning with Vol. V. No. 39. And later published by Executive Intelligence Review. Some of the claims in this massively documented volume include, dash dash a black Republican. A good friend of George Bush, who was responsible for rallying black support for the Bush presidency, became the center of a sex scandal in Nebraska following the collapse of the minority-oriented Franklin Community Credit Union in Omaha, which he directed. This man was Lawrence Larry E. King. Junior King sang the national anthem at both the 1984 and 1988 Republican conventions. The Franklin Committee made a probe into charges of embezzlement, and in November 1988, King's offices were raided by the FBI and $40 million was discovered missing. Within weeks however, the Nebraska Senate, which initially opened the inquiry to find out where the money had gone, instead found itself questioning young adults and teenagers who claimed that they had been child prostitutes. Several social workers and state child care administrators accused King of running a child prostitution ring. The charges grew, as the former police chief of Omaha, the publisher of the state's largest daily newspaper, and several other political associates of King found themselves being accused of patronizing the child prostitution ring. Note, could this help to confirm rumors of a large Nazi infiltration force in Nebraska, similar to claims of similar Nazi presence in Dulce, New Mexico, Reno, Nevada, Montauk, New York, and New Jersey, etc. Interestingly all of these states begin with the letter N, just like Nazi and New Schwabenland do which may or may not have any significance whatsoever, other than mere coincidence. Branton. Although King was given a 15-year federal prison sentence for defrauding the Omaha-based credit union, the magazines Avernimenti of Italy and Pronto of Spain, among others, have charged that King's crimes were more serious, that he ran a national child prostitution ring that serviced the political and business elite of both the Republican and Democratic parties. Several child victims of King's operations charge him with participation in at least one satanic ritual murder of a child several years ago. Also the Washington Post, New York Times, Village Voice and National Law Journal covered the full range of accusations after the story broke in November of 1988. In fact, according to the book, King's money machinations were also linked to the Iran-Contra affair and some say that King provided the CIA with information garnered from his alleged activities as a pimp for the high and mighty. Dash dash, pronto, the Barcelona-based, largest circulation weekly in Spain with over 4.5 million readers stated that Roy Stevens, a private investigator who has worked on the case and who heads the Missing Youth Foundation, says there is reason to believe that the CIA is directly implicated, and that the FBI refuses to help in the investigation and has sabotaged any efforts to get to the bottom of the story. According to this volume, several of the Omaha child prostitutes testified that they had traveled to Washington, D.C. with King and private planes to attend political events which were followed by child sex parties. George Bush's name had repeatedly surfaced in the Nebraska scandal. However his name was first put into print in July 1989, a little less than a month after the Washington Callboy Affair had first made headlines. Omaha's leading daily newspaper reported, one child, who has been under psychiatric care, is said to believe she saw George Bush at one of King's parties.
Gary Caradori was a retired state police investigator who had been hired by the Nebraska Senate to investigate the case, and who had died mysteriously during the course of his investigations. On July 11, 1990, during the course of his investigations, Gary Caradori, 41, died in the crash of his small plane, together with his 8-year-old son, after a mid-air explosion whose cause has not yet been discovered. A skilled and cautious pilot, Karadari told friends repeatedly in the weeks before his death that he feared his plane would be sabotaged. Dash dash Steve Bowman, an Omaha businessman who is compiling a book on the Franklin money and sex scandal, has stated, we do have some credible witnesses who say that single quote why yes, George Bush does have a problem. Child abuse has become one of the epidemics of the 1990s, Bowman told GQ, Gentleman's Quarterly magazine. One of Bowman's sources is a retired psychiatrist who worked for the CIA. He added that cocaine trafficking and political corruption were the other principal themes. Dash, dash, Peter Sawyer, an Australian conservative activist who publishes a controversial newsletter, Inside News, with a circulation of 200,000, dedicated his November 1991 issue exclusively to the Nebraska scandal, wherein he focused on President Bush's links to the affair. In a section captioned, The Original Allegations, Bush first named in 1985, Sawyer writes, If the first allegations about a massive child exploitation ring, centered around Larry King and leading all the way to the White House, had been made in 1989, and had all come from the same source, some shenanigans and mischievous collusion could be suspected. However, the allegations arising out of the Franklin Credit Union collapse were not the first. Way back in 1985, a young girl, Ulysses Lisa Washington, was the center of an investigation by Andrea L. Carriner, of the Nebraska Department of Social Services. The investigation was instigated because Lisa and her sister Tracy continually ran away from their foster parents, Jared and Barbara Webb. Initially reluctant to disclose information for fear of being further punished, the two girls eventually recounted a remarkable story, later backed up by other children who had been fostered out to the Webb's sick. These debriefings were conducted by Mrs. Julie Walters, another welfare officer, who worked for a boy's town at the time, and who had been called in because of the constant reference by the Webb children and others, to that institution. Lisa, supported by her sister, detailed a massive child sex, homosexual, and pornography industry, run in Nebraska by Larry King. She described how she was regularly taken to Washington by plane, with other youths, to attend parties hosted by King and involving many prominent people, including businessmen and politicians. Lisa specifically named George Bush as being in attendance on at least two separate occasions. Remember, this was in 1985, the Australian newsletter emphasized. Mrs. Julie Walters in 1986 interviewed the alleged child prostitute, Lisa, who told her about Mr. Bush. Lisa and her sister Tracy were temporarily living at the time in the home of Kathleen Sorensen another foster parent. Mrs. Walters explained that at first she was very surprised by her revelations, but Lisa, who come from a very underprivileged background with no knowledge of political affairs, gave minute details of her attendance at political meetings around the country. Julie Walters' 50-page handwritten report states, March 25, 1986, met with Kathleen Sorensen and Lisa for about two hours in Blair, Nib. Questioning Lisa for more details about sexual abuse. Lisa admitted to being used as a prostitute by Larry King when she was on trips with his family. She started going on trips when she was in 10th grade. Besides herself and Larry there was also Mrs. King, their son, Prince, and 2-3 other couples. They traveled in Larry's private plane. Lisa said that at these trip parties, which Larry hosted, she sat naked looking pretty and innocent and guests could engage in any sexual activity they wanted, but penetration was not allowed with her. Lisa said she first met Vice President George Bush at the Republican convention that Larry King sang the national anthem at and saw him again at a Washington, D.C. party that Larry hosted. At that party, Lisa saw no women. The polygraph test which Lisa took only centered around sexual abuse committed by Jared Webb. At the time, she had said only general things about Larry's trips, that is where they went, etc. She only began talking about her involvement in prostitution during those trips on March 25, 1986. Lisa also accompanied Mr. and Mrs. King and Prince on trips to Chicago, New York and Washington, D.C. beginning when she was 15 years old. She missed 22 days of school almost totally due to these trips. Lisa was taken along on the pretense of being Prince's babysitter. 
Last year she met Vice President George Bush and saw him again at one of the parties Larry gave while on her Washington, D.C. trip. At some of the parties there are just men, as was the case at the party George Bush attended. Older men and younger men in their early 20s. Lisa said she has seen sodomy committed at those parties. At these parties, Lisa said every guest had a bodyguard and she saw some of the men wearing guns. All guests had to produce a card which was run through a machine to verify who the guest was, in fact, who they said they were. And then each guest was frisked down before entering the party. A Franklin Committee report stated, Apparently she, Lisa, was contacted on December 19, 1988 and voluntarily came to the FBI offices on December 30, 1988. She was interviewed by Brady, Tucker and Phillips. She indicates that in September or October 1984, when Lisa Washington was 14 or 15 years of age, she went on a trip to Chicago with Larry King and 15 to 20 boys from Omaha. She flew to Chicago on a private plane. The plane was large and had rows of two seats apiece on either side of the interior middle aisle. She indicates that King got the boys from Boys Town and the boys worked for him. She stated that Rod Evans and two other boys with the last name of Evans were on the plane. Could not recall the names of the other boys. The boys who flew to Chicago with Washington and King were between the ages of 15 and 18. Most of the boys were black but some were white. She was shown a color photograph of a boy and identified that boy as being one of the boys on the plane. She could not recall his name. She indicates that she was coerced to going on the trip by Barbara Webb. She indicates that she attended a party in Chicago with King and the male youths. She indicated George Bush was present. She indicates that she sat sick at a table at the party while wearing nothing but a negligee. She stated that George Bush saw her on the table. She stated she saw George Bush pay King money and that Bush left the party with a 19-year-old black boy named Brent. Lisa stated that the party George Bush attended was in Chicago in September or October 1984. According to the Chicago Tribune of October 31, 1984, Bush was in fact in Illinois campaigning for congressional candidates at the end of October. Ulysses Lisa indicated that she recognized George Bush as coming to the party and that Bush had two large white males with him. Euless indicated Bush came to the party approximately 45 minutes after it started and that he was greeted by Larry King. Euless indicated that she knew George Bush due to the fact that he had been in political campaigns and also she had observed a picture of Bush with Larry King at Larry King's house in Omaha. The report stated, Lisa was given four polygraph tests administered by a state trooper at the State Patrol Office on Center Street in Omaha. The state trooper, after Lisa's testing was completed, told another foster parent he tried to break Lisa down, but he was convinced she was telling the truth. If the deviant machinations of George Herbert, the pervert, Bush and his fellow Nazi conspirators isn't enough to fan the flames of your patriotic indignation to the melting point, then just read the following regarding the ringleaders, the German immigrant billionaire family, the Rockefellers, er, I mean the Rockefellers. Population control, Nazis, and the UN, by Anton Chaitkin. Rockefeller and Mass Murder. The Rockefeller Foundation is the prime sponsor of public relations for the United Nations Drastic Depopulation Program, which the world is invited to accept at the UN's scheduled September conference in Cairo, Egypt. Evidence in the possession of a growing number of researchers in America, England, and Germany demonstrates that the Foundation and its corporate, medical, and political associates organize the racial mass murder program of Nazi Germany. These globalists, who function as a conduit for British Empire geopolitics, were not stopped after World War II. The United Nations alliance of the old Nazi right wing with the New Age left wing poses an even graver danger to the world today than the same grouping did in 1941. Oil monopolist John D. Rockefeller created the family-run Rockefeller Foundation in 1909. By 1929 he had placed $300 million worth of the family's controlling interest in the Standard Oil Company of New Jersey, later called Exxon, to the account of the foundation. The foundation's money created the medical specialty known as psychiatric genetics. For the new experimental field, the foundation reorganized medical teaching in Germany, creating and thenceforth continuously directing the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Psychiatry and the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Anthropology eugenics and human heredity. The Rockefellers' chief executive of these institutions was the fascist Swiss psychiatrist Ernst Rudin, assisted by his protégés Otmar Verschuer and Franz J. Kalman. In 1932, 
The British-led eugenics movement designated the Rockefellers Dr. Rudin as the president of the Worldwide Eugenics Federation. The movement called for the killing or sterilization of people whose heredity made them a public burden. The racial laws. A few months later, Hitler took over Germany and the Rockefeller Rudin apparatus became a section of the Nazi state. The regime appointed Rudin head of the Racial Hygiene Society. Rudin and his staff, as part of the task force of heredity experts chaired by SS Chief Heinrich Himmler, drew up the sterilization law. Described as an American model law, it was adopted in July 1933 and proudly printed in the September 1933 Eugenical News USA with Hitler's signature. The Rockefeller Group drew up other race laws, also based on existing Virginia statutes. The T4 single quote unit of the Hitler Chancery, based on psychiatrists led by Rudin and his staff, cooperated in creating propaganda films to sell mercy killing euthanasia to German citizens. The public reacted antagonistically. Hitler had to withdraw a tearjerker right to die film from the movie theaters. The proper groundwork had not yet been laid. Under the Nazis, the German chemical company IG Farben and Rockefeller's standard Exxon Oil of New Jersey were effectively a single firm, merged in hundreds of cartel arrangements. IG Farben was led up until 1937 by the Warburg family, Rockefeller's partner in banking and in the design of Nazi German eugenics. Following the German invasion of Poland in 1939, Standard Oil pledged to keep the merger with IG Farben going even if the United States entered the war. This was exposed in 1942 by Senator Harry Truman's investigating committee, and President Roosevelt took hundreds of legal measures during the war to stop the Standard, IG Farben cartel from supplying the enemy war machine. In 1940-41, IG Farben built a gigantic factory at Auschwitz in Poland to utilize the standard oil-slash-IG Farben patents with concentration camp slave labor to make gasoline from coal. The SS was assigned to guard the Jewish and other inmates and select for killing those who were unfit for IG Farben slave labor. Standard Germany President Emil Helferich testified after the war that standard oil funds helped pay for SS guards at Auschwitz. In 1940, six months after the notorious Standard-I.G. meeting, European Rockefeller Foundation official Daniel O'Brien wrote to the Foundation's chief medical officer Alan Gregg that it would be unfortunate if it was chosen to stop research which has no relation to war issues. So the Foundation continued financing Nazi psychiatric research, which translates into mind control research. Branton during the war. In 1936, Rockefeller's Dr. Franz Kohlmann interrupted his study of hereditary degeneracy and emigrated to America because he was half Jewish. Coleman went to New York and established the Medical Genetics Department of the New York State Psychiatric Institute. The Scottish Rite of Freemason republished Coleman's study of over 1,000 cases of schizophrenia, which tried to prove its hereditary basis. In the book, Coleman thanked his longtime boss and mentor Rudin. Coleman's book, published in 1938 in the USA and Nazi Germany, was used by the T4 unit as a rationalization to begin in 1939 the murder of mental patients and various defective people, perhaps most of them children. Gas and lethal injections were used to kill 250,000 under this program, in which the staffs for a broader murder program were desensitized and trained. Dr. Mengele. In 1943, Otmar Verschier's assistant Joseph Mengele was made medical commandant of Auschwitz. As wartime director of Rockefeller's Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Anthropology, Eugenics and Human Heredity in Berlin, Verschier secured funds for Mengele's experiments at Auschwitz from the German Research Council. Verschier wrote a progress report to the council, My co-researcher in this research is my assistant the anthropologist and physician Mengele. He is serving as Hauptsturmfeher and camp doctor in the concentration camp Auschwitz. With the permission of the Reichsfeher SS Himmler, Anthropological research is being undertaken on the various racial groups in the concentration camps and blood samples will be sent to my laboratory for investigation. Mengele prowl on the railroad lines leading into Auschwitz, looking for twins, a favorite subject of psychiatric geneticists. On arrival at Mengele's experimental station, twins filled out a detailed questionnaire from the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. There were daily drawings of blood for Verschier's specific protein research. Needles were injected into eyes for work on eye color. There were experimental blood transfusions and infections. Organs and limbs were removed, sometimes without anesthetics. Sex changes were attempted. Females were sterilized, males were castrated. Thousands were murdered and their organs, 
eyeballs, heads, and limbs were sent to Verschur and the Rockefeller Group at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. Remember, the Rockefellers were originally German immigrants to America. Branton, in 1946, Verschur wrote to the Bureau of Human Heredity in London, asking for help in continuing his scientific research. Facelift. In 1947, the Bureau of Human Heredity moved from London to Copenhagen. The new Danish building for this was built with Rockefeller money. The first International Congress in Human Genetics following World War II was held at this Danish Institute in 1956. By that time, Verschur was a member of the American Eugenics Society, then indistinguishable from Rockefeller's Population Council. Dr. Coleman helped save Verschur by testifying in his denazification proceedings. Dr. Coleman created the American Society of Human Genetics, which organized the Human Genome Project. Based at Los Alamos Labs and in turn the more covert research and development projects within the Dulce, New Mexico base, which is also involved in researching any and every form of sophisticated occult technology imaginable. Branton, a current $3 billion physical multiculturalism effort. Coleman was a director of the American Eugenics Society in 1952 and from 1954 to 1965. In the 1950s, the Rockefellers reorganized the, the United States eugenics movement in their own family offices, with spin-off population control and abortion groups the Eugenics Society changed its name to the Society for the Study of Social Biology, its current name. The Rockefeller Foundation had long financed the eugenics movement in England, apparently repaying Britain for the fact that British Capital and an Englishman partner had started old John D. Rockefeller out in his oil trust. In the 1960s, the Eugenics Society of England adopted what they called crypto-eugenics, stating in their official reports that they would de-eugenics through means and instruments not labeled as eugenics. With support from the Rockefellers, the Eugenics Society England set up a subcommittee called the International Planned Parenthood Federation, which for 12 years had no other address than the Eugenics Society. Note, Margaret Sanger plays a central role in this Planned Parenthood network. And people blast Rush Limbaugh for calling Sangra Femi Nazi when in fact that's exactly and literally what it comes down to when one considers her full support of the Nazis' Aryan racial supremacy philosophies. In the 1980s there were an estimated 50 million or more abortions worldwide, many of which can be attributed to the genocidal agendas of Planned Parenthood. In her book Pivot of Civilization, in reference to free maternity care for the poor, Sanger states, Instead of decreasing and aiming to eliminate the stocks that are most detrimental to the future of the race and the world it tends to render them to a menacing degree dominant. And in reference to her Negro project of the late 1930s, which aimed at recruiting black ministers, physicians and political leaders for the purpose of encouraging birth control and sterilization in the black community, Sanger wrote, We do not want word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. And the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. Since Sanger is part of the Aryan supremacy agenda, it is remarkable that she would allow information about Planned Parenthood's real genocidal agenda to slip out through her writings. The core issue of most of the incendiary pro-abortion slash anti-abortion arguments should not be whether a mother's right to kill a human being with a beating heart supersedes a child's right to live. That's merely a means that Planned Parenthood has used to conceal their fascist genocidal agendas, that is to hide them behind divisive arguments about constitutional rights of mothers versus those of children. The core issue should be whether or not fascist white supremacists should commit genocide against targeted non-Aryan races through abortion, sterilization, infanticide, and other methods. Branton, this, then, is the private, international apparatus which has set the world up for a global holocaust, under the UN flag. Note, following is an interesting byproduct of ARCO, the Atlantic Richfield Company, which has been getting a good deal of attention throughout internet discussion groups. Could such a powerful project be used against American citizens by ARCO or other proponents of the New World Order? Branton. Earth Island Journal, Fall 94, ARCO, Eastland and the Roots of ARP. By Gary Smith. All Atomic and Electronic Technologies from household appliances to nuclear weapons, radiate energetic particles. While the immediate impacts of human-caused electromagnetic pollution are generally imperceptible, the long-term consequences for the biosphere can be profound. In 1988, Omni magazine raised concerns about the environmental consequences of a bizarre electromagnetic invention. According to Omni, Arco, the, the United States oil giant, 
found itself wondering what to do with the estimated 30 trillion cubic feet of natural gas that it hoped to extract from Alaska's North Slope. While this was enough energy to supply the, the United States for a year, the gas fields were too far from any potential customers. Rico concluded that it would be too expensive to liquefy the gas and ship it thousands of miles to urban centers. What was needed was a client that wanted access to vast amounts of energy on site, in the wilds of Alaska. Bernard Eastland, an MIT and Columbia University physicist with eight years' experience with the Atomic Energy Commission, came to the rescue with an extraordinary plan to use the energy at the point of production. Eastland, who soon became president of Arco's Production Technologies International Company in Houston, proposed burning the vast Alaskan gas fields to power a huge electric generator. The resulting power would be directed into a huge antenna complex, 40 miles on the side. The antennae would be used to focus an intense beam of electromagnetic energy into the upper atmosphere, where it would collide with the ionosphere to create a phenomenon called the mirror force. Eastland was granted a United States patent number 4,686,605 for this invention on August 11, 1987. You can virtually lift part of the upper atmosphere, Eastland told Omni, you can make it move, do things to it. One of the tricks Eastland envisioned involved surgically distorting the ionosphere to disrupt global communications. Pushing the upper atmosphere around might also generate high-altitude drag that could heat and deflect enemy missiles or surround them with high-energy electrons that might cause the missiles to detonate in mid-trajectory. The proposal appealed to the Pentagon, which invested several hundred thousand dollars evaluating Eastland's work. Eastland maintained that there were peaceful uses for his technology. In one scenario, he explained how beams of electromagnetic power could lift portions of the upper atmosphere and redirect the jet stream to alter global weather patterns. Using plumes of atmospheric particles to act as a lens or focusing device, Eastland proposed redirecting sunlight and heat to different parts of the Earth's surface, making it possible to manipulate wind patterns, cause rainstorms in Ethiopia, drive hurricanes out of the Caribbean, incinerate airborne industrial pollution and sew up the hole in the Antarctic ozone layer. Because the upper atmosphere is extremely sensitive to small changes in its composition, Omni cautioned, merely testing an Eastland device could cause irreversible damage. And also we have the following article, titled, Doomsday Death Ray. Subtitle, Is the, the United States Government Testing a Secret Mega Weapon? By Agent X. The Nose Magazine, Issue Number 26, March 1995. We have to ask ourselves, just WHO will have control of this weapon? especially if Arco is deeply involved with the High Arc project. Beginning some ways into the article, in marked contrast to other advanced weapons-related programs, High Arc is not part of the officially denied Black World budget. Rather, the military insists that High Arc is a strictly scientific program to study the Aurora Borealis or Northern Lights, when in fact it is a device intended to seriously tweak the ionosphere for purposes that are less than benign. Built by Arco Power Technologies, High ARP is due to begin initial testing as this story goes to press. During 1996, a planned $75 million increase to the already multi-megabit project will increase the output of the system to over 1.7 gigawatts, making High ARP the most powerful emitter in the world. Several smaller sites exist around the world, most notably in Russia. Though these installations cannot match the ionosphere heating capabilities of High ARP, some experts in the field who wish not to be quoted suggest that some aberrant weather conditions may have been caused by their operation. The weapon development whiz kids have been interested in this sort of gizmo for quite some time. Just what in hell does the military want with the world's largest weenie roaster? Here are some possible applications I've discovered. Earth penetrating topography. Sort of a CAT scan for the planet. By heating the ionosphere to create a resonant mirror. Electronic beam steering directs an energy stream to specific coordinates on the planet. This energy penetrates the ground to a depth of a kilometer or more, and the signal return is received by satellite or aircraft. After computer processing, a relatively clear picture of what is underground emerges. Damn handy when trying to figure out where those wily North Koreans hide their nukes, or where you keep your stash. Hard kill weapon system. The output of HARP would have to be boosted a thousand fold, but if that is accomplished, a shell of high-speed electrons can be constructed that encompasses the Earth. Any ballistic missile or warhead passing through the shell would explode. Soft kill weapon system. By directing enormous amounts of radio frequency energy at a specific area, 
Power could overload electrical power distribution grids, fry sensitive microelectronics, detonate weapons that use electronic fuses, scramble missile guidance systems, and probably upset brain chemistry. Weather modification. Heating the upper atmosphere over specific areas could change weather patterns, creating torrential floods, destroying an enemy's infrastructure or denying an enemy's harvest by drought. Weather as a weapon. Identification of satellites. By illuminating orbiting spacecraft with HARP, the constituent materials and the mission of a satellite can be assessed. Communications. Possible uses include satellite jamming, satellite communications with submarines and detection of stealth aircraft. Physicist Bernard Eastland, president of production technologies company and former ARCO Bigwig, was granted three patents over the past seven years for a system that looks suspiciously like HARP, though much larger. His plan, using a transmitter encompassing 160 square miles and powered by massive amounts of electricity generated using vast Alaskan natural gas reserves to which ARCO has access, was to shoot down missiles and alter the weather. ARCO initially owned Eastland's patents, but was soon paid a visit by Edward Teller, the father of the H-bomb, Nevada test site coordinator for the Star Wars Horse D defense program, and Major MJ-12 member. Branton. And development grew secretive. Eastland declined further involvement, and the patents were quietly sold in June 1994 to E-Systems, a high-tech corporation famous for ultra-secret defense projects such as the President's customized Boeing 747 Doomsday Plane. HARP is the perfect first step towards a plan like mine, Eastland says. Advances in phased array transmitter technology and power generation can produce the field strength required. The government will say it isn't so, but if it quacks like a duck and it looks like a duck, there's a good chance it is duck. Eastland is nuts, says an Air Force official speaking on condition of anonymity. HARP is much smaller and less powerful than his instrument. We are not doing anything except good science and pure research. The real beauty of HARP, he then adds cryptically, is that nothing you can see on the outside is sensitive. The secret is the beam steering agility and pulsing of the transmissions. When covert operations occur, the science team, the operating funds and the mission will be black. Whatever is going on, Alaskans are mad as hell. The federal government enjoys a long tradition of screwing over the inhabitants of the last frontier. Generally speaking, the feds are as welcome as a case of herpes. And studies done by the EPA, the Swedish government and others indicate that HARP could interfere with communications, navigation systems, wildlife migration and possibly human health. There has never been a transmitter of this power in this frequency, Eastland says. It would be wise to assess its impact. Though there are many questions, the military insists that all is well and there is nothing to worry about. We are not doing anything to the ionosphere, we are just looking at it, insists Air Force Phillips Laboratory spokesman Roy Heitman. Although an ad hoc grassroots organization called No Harp is trying to stop the project, founder Claire Zikur admits, it's on a whitewash, Harp is going to happen. An ARCO retiree, Zikur is convinced Harp is a secret weapons project. It is all the appearances of a secret program. This is not good science, they have no idea what this thing could do to the ionosphere. To put this in the hands of the military scares the hell out of me. Note, remember however that, although this particular Exarco employee, Zakur, is against the project, the HARP facility in Alaska was nevertheless constructed by ARCO Power Technologies. So Zakur's views apparently do not reflect the views of ARCO in general in regards to the project. Branton, and if you're not yet convinced that ARCO, the Atlantic Richfield Company, is a front for the fascist Nazifeller New World Order infiltration of, if not invasion of, North America, then try this one on for size, ARCO Alieska, Wagon Hut, illegal spying, organized crime. Oh what a tangled web we weave. Statement of the Honorable George Miller. Chairman, House Interior and Insular Affairs Committee. Oversight hearings on Alieska covert operations. November 4. 1991. A few excerpts from this lengthy hearing appear below. Branton, this is the first of two days of hearings before the House Interior Committee on the subject of covert surveillance authorized by the Alieska Pipeline Service Company and conducted by the Wakenhut Corporation. On August 7 of this year, the Committee on Interior and Insular Affairs filed a written request for documents from Wakenhut and Alieska in connection with allegations that the Wakenhut Corporation conducted undercover surveillance of Charles Hamill on behalf of Alieska and its owner companies. In letters to both Wakenhut and Alieska, 
I expressed concern that the surveillance of Mr. Hamill was for the purpose of obtaining information on and or interfering with Mr. Hamill's communications with this committee. Charles Hamill has been a source of information for Congress, state and federal regulatory agencies, and the media, concerning environmental, health and safety violations by Alaska and its oil company owners, that is, Arco or Atlantic Richfield. Branton. Mr. Hamill has served as a conduit for whistleblowers, including Alaska employees, to make public information on oil industry practices. At the same time, Mr. Hamill has at least two significant business disputes with Alaska and Exxon. In the next two days, we will explore the issue of whether Alaska's use of a bogus environmental group formed by Wackenhut spies was an effort to disrupt and compromise a source of information for this committee's continuing investigation of oil industry practices in Alaska. In my view, it is important to find out why some of the largest and most powerful corporations in this country would resort to such elaborate sting tactics to invade and destroy the privacy of Mr. Hamill, federal and state officials, environmentalists and ordinary citizens. We believe that the testimony and the evidence presented in these hearings during the next two days will show that the covert surveillance operation involved the much more sinister and disturbing motives of silencing environmental critics and intimidating whistleblowers. Testimony of Charles Hamill. Before the United States House of Representatives of the United States Congress Committee on Interior and Insular Affairs. 2226 Rayburn House Office Building, Washington, D. C. November 4 and 5, 1991. Note, the following is just one excerpt from the lengthy transcript of the hearing, Branton. In 1988, Arco, Exxon and British Petroleum failed to tell this committee about the existence of the PT. McIntyre billion barrel oil field directly under the West Dock, virtually within sight of the Alaska pipeline, while they were testifying that Prato Bay was running dry. In fact, both Arco and Exxon knew that they had discovered the PT. McIntyre field years earlier. In 1989, my general partner, Exxon, told me that our PT. McIntyre leases were dry. I sold my interest in the leases for what Exxon told me was a fair price. Several weeks after selling Exxon my interests, the major discovery was announced. Once again, they lied to you, they lied to the Congress, they lied to the public, and they defrauded us all. Here is an interesting report that I came across which suggests that the fascist conspiracy against America goes deeper than some might dare to believe. War of the Caverns. By Tom Lucas. If the importance of the caverns beneath Salome Springs and Eureka Springs CIA Masonic Mafia underground drug capital in Arkansas is a bane of contention between the picturesque little towns, Hot Springs, Arkansas, would be the next logical choice for investigation. During the 1930 Prohibition days, it was frequently reported in a Chicago newspaper that Chicago gangsters traveled often to Hot Springs to go to the horse races and soak in the hot baths. It seems reasonable based on what we think we know now, that during the lulls in recreational activities in Hot Springs, leaders of the various gangs made discreet trips to the caverns beneath the city to brag about their latest exploits and to bring offerings of gold. To get a rough idea of what a cavern map of the United States would look like, simply pull out a road map of any state and identify all of the dense population centers, be they cities or hamlets. Where there is a city on the surface of the earth, there is a city in the caverns below that city. As above, so below. The correlation breaks down as the size of the population centers dwindle. In the early 1930s, the caverns of Hot Springs must have been the, the United States capital, or at least a regional area, for the marketers of illegal alcohol. Cavern communities close to the surface are probably not completely self-supporting and require huge injections of funds to keep them going. These facilities lack the super technologies of those caverns much deeper in the earth and require much gold for trading with people within cities deeper in the Earth's crust. An ounce of gold in the underworld has as much or greater buying power than on the surface because the deeper super productive cities need all the gold they can get and are willing to make generous trades for gold. This relieves the near-surface caverns of the burden of secreting goods and services from the surface world, which would be a real security headache. Cities beneath cities, and some hamlets, require injections of wealth from the surface that doesn't leave paper trails to their caverns. Each cavern has to develop and specialize in some particular money-making scam, or any number of sting embezzlements to bring in a constant stream of traceless cash and gold. One cavern, for example, specializes in addictive drug sales, another bank embezzlement and fraud, another stock market riggings, government money transfer schemes, 
along with other more esoteric and less known ways of generating profit that must eventually be converted to cash and gold that cannot be traced. The expression underground cash economy is probably a semi-cryptic phrase that refers directly to installations beneath cities notorious for dealing only in cash and gold. Note, the notorious inner world researcher and writer Richard Shaver did state that organized crime syndicates were one of the larger elements operating within the secret cavern systems, and that the term, the underworld, as a description of organized crime networks, is more than just a coincidence. Branton. When America was young, Developing underground caverns beneath American cities having a flavor of anarchy similar to communities developing on the surface, did not at the time have formal relations with each other. Not even Wild West subsurface communities in the American West. As above, so below. Over a period of time, cavern communities within regional areas geographically near each other found they had to get along with each other in a non-competitive manner, to encourage synergetic relationships which tended to raise the standard of living of each of the involved cavern communities. Each cavern specialized in an area of crime monopoly expertise that wasn't in competition with neighboring caverns. If a regional area demonstrated it could keep surface dwellers in line, for example, keep them thinking the right thoughts, stifling all real creativity, via the underground's crack people management teams and organizations on the surface in the form of police departments, public schools, controlling secret societies, quack medical fraternities, polished propagandists and moralists, a sufficiently initiated clergy, etc., then this regional area is allowed to incorporate into a semi-autonomous fiefdom that would eventually reflect on the surface as a county in the, the United States. As above, so below. These underground fiefdoms in the form of counties then combine to form states. States combine to form the nation. Today, 33 degree masonry and a higher degree 33 plus is getting ready for the final conflict between right wing caverns RWC and left wing caverns LWC. This Hegelian slash Machiavellian conflict will not be so much a battle between countries on the surface as it will a war of the caverns. Surface 33 plus is clandestinely developing relatively unknown caverns beneath smaller communities which 33 plus degree confidently feels will not be identified and destroyed once the conflict begins. Surface 32 degree and below are to be left on the surface to die with the rest of the profane. The deal is, knowing a real holocaust is coming, 33 plus is planning to abandon the old underground installations and flee to the new when the time arrives. It appears that both left and right wing factions will be responsible for the sacrifice of huge segments of the Earth's above and below ground populations. Note, take note of the fact that the Jesuit created Scottish Rite Hand and the black Gnostic serpent cult of the Illuminati of Bavaria, which both collaborated in the establishing of the 33 degree system of masonry, have their ultimate headquarters in Rome and Bavaria, those two regions which made up the dual headquarters of the UN Holy Roman Empire. These were the same forces which brought about the Machiavellian conflicts between right and left wing factions in World War I and World War II. Now they're apparently planning for a third Machiavellian global conflict, this one being nuclear in scope, above and below the surface of the planet, a conflict which they intend to rid out in their secret underground strongholds and eventually emerge to control the upper and lower worlds. It would be an elaborate helter-skelter scenario. Helter Skelter being the term that mass murderer Charles Manson used for his plan to incite a race war which he and his family would ride out in an underground cavern in the Mojave Desert which he referred to as the Pit. Once the Holocaust had ended and most of those on the surface were dead, Manson and his followers believed that they would emerge from their hiding place and rule the world. If such a plan seems to be the product of an insane mind, then it would appear that Charles Manson was not alone in his insanity, which is a scary thought. Another thought. Just what part do the alien greys play in the 33 plus Mason's plans? Incidentally, there are reportedly several levels above and beyond the 33rd degree, mainly those which interface with and collaborate with alien fraternities or secret societies below and beyond planet Earth. For instance the alternative two single quote and alternative three single quote forces who, in collaboration with the greys, have exploited and oppressed numerous slot worlds throughout this sector of the galaxy, according to one couple who in Unicus magazine told of how they defected from the alternative three agenda after a federation agent informed them of these facts. The Nazi Neuschwabians are deeply involved in these joint humanoid reptiloid interstellar atrocities against the peaceful inhabitants of other colonial worlds. The atrocities of World War II were just the beginning, since the Nazi Holocaust, if we are to believe some contactees.
has spread beyond the surface of this planet, both within and without. As for the 33 plus levels of masonry, according to former Dulce base security officer Thomas E. Costello, who possessed one of the highest security clearances at the base, Ultra 7, there were several security clearances above his own that the higher initiates held, such as Umbra, Stellar, and UMS, Universal Military Service. In his writings Whitley Stryber tells of being taken during an abduction experience to another desert-like planet with ancient ruins and tall, gray, type beings. He encountered American military personnel on this interplanetary excursion who were dressed in military khakis, carried camcorders and other unusual equipment. These military personnel would probably have possessed a security clearance similar to one of those mentioned above. According to Costello, President Harry Truman was a high archon in the interplanetary lodges and one of the first the United States presidents to establish a secret American treaty with greys from Alpha Draconis and Epsilon Boots as well as with the subterranean Ashtar forces. George Bush was apparently at one point a 42nd degree Mason, according to another source who I believe to be reliable. He would have to have been considerably high in the degrees if he were involved with MJ-12 as is claimed. So the 33 plus degrees of masonry are the alien interactive levels, and we are meant to believe that there are only 33 degrees and no more. The Scottish Rite's infiltration of the Masonic Lodges challenged the domination of the more Judeo-Christian York Rite. The Scottish Rite can be traced back to the Jesuit College of Claremont in France, and at the core it advocates a global government and the destruction of all national boundaries sovereignties and cultures. The dissolution of all traditional family structures making all children the wards of the world state. And the destruction of the idea that man has a soul, or rather that humans are merely evolved animals having no spiritual nature and therefore no need for God. In other words a homogenized collective society which does not tolerate individual expression but instead enforces absolute conformity to the controlling establishment, kind of like the system which the greys themselves live under. According to former 33rd degree Mason James Shaw, author of The Deadly Deception, though the United States headquarters of the Scottish Rite is located in the House of the Temple in Washington, D.C., click image right, and, according to some, it sits directly over an antediluvian system of Atlantine tunnels and ancient underground chambers called the Nod Complex, which serves as a major NSA Syrian gray center of collaboration. Some believe that the antediluvian or Atlantean alchemists or sorcerer scientists had begun experimenting with elemental forces and that their experiments had gone out of control and created a temporal rift in the space-time continuum in the so-called Bermuda Triangle region, opening up a hole between dimensions and leaving electromagnetic fallout which has had adverse effects to this day. This was just prior to the global deluge which destroyed their island continent. This house of the temple is, according to Jim Shaw, filled with murals, statues, and carvings of serpents. In other words it is a serpent cult. This pagan temple actually sits at the northern point of the pentagram-like street layout of downtown DC, which is not surprising when we consider that much of the original construction of Washington DC was carried out by Masons. After what was supposed to be the culmination of a lifetime of initiatory work, Shell was excited about his 33rd degree initiation which was attended by two former United States presidents a famous evangelist, and a Scandinavian king. He was anticipating a type of spiritual illumination, however the dead, dry ritual and the tomb-like atmosphere of the temple itself was far from inspiring. Following the disillusioning experience he left the building, looked at the entrance above which was written the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, and, realizing that it was all a lie he sadly said to himself, it isn't Scottish, it isn't right, and it isn't free. He left the lodge and never returned and from that day on became a Christian evangelist and one of its most notorious critics. Some state that as part of the 33rd degree initiation one is challenged to blaspheme Christ, spitting on a cross or a Bible or something of the sort. If the initiate refuses to do so they are told you have made the right decision and remain forever in the 33rd degree. If they do commit the act of blasphemy however, they are told you have made the right decision and continue their ascension through the degrees beyond the 33rd. The lowest degrees are presumably Christian and many share membership jointly in Masonry and Christian denominations. As one ascends higher, the Christian beliefs are slowly and almost imperceptibly subverted so by the time the 33rd degree has reached one has arrived on the verge of Luciferianism. Those who have been through the degrees must admit that what they are being taught now is almost diametrically opposed to what they were taught in the lowest degrees.
This is the work of the Scottish Rite which infiltrated the Masonic Lodges for the purposes of using them as a framework for the establishment of their godless New World Order. In Masonry the Lodge is God, the Grand Architect of the Universe, which is simply another name for the Lodge itself. Branton. At the same time Underground 33 Plus develops remote survival caverns, an activity generally unknown to underground inhabitants, including 32 Dash. They're also developing caverns without support communities which, above, could pinpoint their survival caverns for target purposes. Without support communities to obscure their activities, surface masons are deprived of this advantage. When one moves to a cavern without a support community above, it is similar to a surface dweller moving from the city to the countryside. Unless there is access to needed goods and services available at alien facilities much deeper in the earth, each time the remote cavern dweller needs something from the store he has to travel to a cavern with a support community above to get what is wanted. While in the Navy, I was told that only five men, who were sworn to secrecy, decided the targets for America's bombs. Also that these five men were the only ones who know where the bombs were going. This means targeting information inside the IGBMs are sealed and not even technicians loading the programs know what is on them. Bombing instructions for nuclear bomber pilots are sealed. This means submarine captains do not know where their IGBMs are headed. All the captain does is tell the missile its location and the missile decides where to go. Apparently an almost unlimited number of possible target guidance programs are generated and placed in a library made available to these five men. To be installed in missiles appropriate for specific targets, all is sealed and safely locked away. I'm sure the method by which all this is done is complex and thought out in a way understood by none other than the five select men. I doubt the system has changed since my Navy days of years ago. The activities of these men and the targets selected are never audited. Note, just as the secret agencies like MJ-12 are never audited since congressional investigators are only allowed top secret clearances, whereas MJ-12 and similar agencies operate at above top secret levels and beyond. In fact the charter for the NSA, for instance, states that the NSA is exempt from all the United States laws which do not specifically mention the NSA within the text. So here is a job for you congressional legislators. Mention the NSA in every new or old regulatory law that might be applicable. Branton. The person who told me this said there is no way of ascertaining if these five men are even on our side. Though the faces of the men may change over the years, the system of security remains the same. These five men must all be Masons, which means there is much room for mischief. 300 the United States citizens were made ready for the 1917 Russian Revolution. Taught the Russian language and left-wing socialist ideology, they were shipped off to Russia to form the first Politburo. Plainly, this means that socialist Russia is a tool and puppet state of the United States. Note, or, more exactly the Masonic banksters operating within the, the United States, as for instance the Rockefellers, who played a major role in grooming the agents of the Communist Socialist Revolution in Russia and the agents of the National Socialist Revolution in Germany. Whether it is left-handed socialism or right-handed socialism, socialism either way you look at it is totalitarianism. Branton. Any recent reforms in Russia will not change the fact that she is still taking orders from the Bavarian-backed 33 plus Jesuit masons in the, the United States UN. Although the front men may change, Left-wing socialists are very adept at making reforms that increase their power. All of which indicates that it is unlikely that the bulk of America's atomic arsenal is aimed at Russia, as claimed and, for the most part, it is unlikely that Russia's atomic arsenal is aimed at the United States. The only missiles targeted for the, the United States would be aimed at the underground installations of the most lethal of right-wing adversaries. After all, the effectiveness of our underground nuclear bomb testing program is just that. A test showing just how efficiently each bomb design destroys underground caverns. Summarizing, it appears that both Russian and American nuclear arsenals stand ready to fire in concert. But what? The answer is at all of the caverns which, occupied by the enemy of World War II, namely, the Nazis, Branton, are awaiting the time to deliver their nuclear missiles from sanctuaries beneath the Antarctic, and from cavern strongholds beneath South, Central and North America. Note. The 33 plus themselves are neither against the right nor left wing forces, but rather control the leadership of each, so as to set the two forces against each other in a Machiavellian or Hegelian scenario, with more than a little help from their reptiloid and grey alien advisors. 
This plan seems to have been traced back to the Masonic point of Albert Pike, who called himself the Vice Regent of Lucifer on Earth, and his Jesuit deputy Giuseppe Mazzini. According to De Griffin, Pike and Mazzini established the 22 Illuminati Palladium Lodges for the express purpose of creating the right-wing Nazi and left-wing communist movements and to lay the foundation for three world wars which they hoped would wear down the masses to the point where they would accept a new world order dictatorship as the only peaceful alternative. From the alien perspective, the new world order would offer easier control and massive population reduction at the same time. As I have suggested, we can also surmise that the 33-plus Masons leading the right-wing factions and the 33-plus Masons leading the left-wing factions are all working closely together along with their reptilian allies beneath and beyond this planet. When and if the final conflict breaks out, we can expect the high-ranking leaders of both sides of the Machiavellian conflict to leave the so-called left-wing communist socialists and the so-called right-wing national socialists to their fate with the hope and expectation that they will slaughter each other and eliminate all resistance when they, the Roman Bavarian 33 plus Jesuit Mason Banksters and their alien house in Orion and Draconis as well as some collaborating factions from Sirius B slash Hale Bop, etc., emerge to take control of the planet. In reference to the Syrian collaborators, a major irony exists in the fact that the Sirius B zealots connected with the Hale Bop complex, who are so determined to stage a mass landing on Earth may be largely motivated by the fact that several of their light underground colonies on Earth and in this system have been and are under attack by the reptiloid gray collectivists. Apparently they believe that by supporting their secret society allies here on Earth, who are in turn intent on establishing a new world order, they will be in a better position to defend themselves and their ancient bases and colonies here from the Draconians' grays. Yet, they are in fact serving what they have been led to believe are ascended masters within the hale -Bob complex itself, Unaware that their beloved Ashtar hierarchy has long since been infiltrated by Arianite Dracos and Greys. In a similar manner, the Orion-backed Jesuit Lodge had managed to infiltrate the Syrian-backed Masonic Lodge on Earth via the Jesuit Scottish Rite, and just as the Syrians have been duped into submitting to the agenda of the Orionites in Hale Boop, the Masons have been duped into forming an alliance with the Jesuits in the form of the Bilderberg Society. If the Masonic Lodge and our own constitutional the United States government can be infiltrated by Draconian Arianite interventionists, then are those from Sirius B who live in an even more collectivist system any more exempt from the same threat? Maybe one day they, and we, will learn that the Draconians are playing for keeps and that there is no level of deception to which they will not sink in order to get their way. Just like us. The Syrians and their Masonic representatives on Earth have been so concerned about defending themselves from an enemy without, that they and we have ignored the infiltration of the enemy within. Branton. This explains why though the United States and Russia have such a large surplus of atomic bombs. Caverns tend to be nuclear proof, except for direct hits which mean that at least one bomb is needed per cavern, and perhaps several just in case the first one fails to make it. All those bombs going off will have a negative environmental impact on our life on the surface. But the 33 plus plan to be safe and snug in their holes. Both sides could fire all their arsenals at once. But this is unlikely to happen. World War II will be protracted like a chess game and both sides will agree to a standard set of rules for war. As the war progresses and the world's standard of living drops, squabbles over remaining resources will become frequent and pointed. States will fight states. Counties will fight counties, towns will fight towns, all of which will reflect the political biases and inclinations of controlling caverns beneath. Did you know that only group organisms such as anthills and termite colonies, and Masonic controlled men, indulge in mass warfare? Nothing else in nature does. All group organisms, such as beehives, use sex odors via the queen bee to induce conformity in the hive or colony. Scottish Rite masonry is most similar to the termite colony in that both chew away at the foundations of civilization and neither can stand the light of day. Masonry may not use sex odors to induce conformity and absorption into the group organism, but it does use mesmerizing, hypnotic rays that may have sexual content to it. Selfless devotion to service. Faceless anonymity. Slavish devotion to a noble ideal. For the good of the whole. Work without compensation. Profitless causes. These are the value philosophical ideals of an an in an ant hill, a termite in a termite colony. Animation in a Masonic organism. Interesting is how cleverly encyclopedias talk about springs but never caverns, and that DeSoto was more curious about caverns than springs.
The tunnels I recently learned of that led off from basement rooms in the old Knights of Pythias Temple in Springfield, Missouri, which is in the heart of the Ozarks, gives pause for a lot of wonder and conjecture. Until recently, I thought only a few surface dwellers knew and had access to the underworld, but it now appears to be common knowledge among those of a specific segment of the population. It's just that those who talk don't live long. More of what the Aryan elite plan for America and the world was revealed in a lecture given by the late Phil Schneider, who was murdered, strangled to death by persons unknown shortly after giving this speech, I love the country I am living in, more than I love my life, but I would not be standing before you now, risking my life, if I did not believe it was so. The first part of this talk is going to concern deep underground military bases and the black budget. The black budget is a secretive budget that garners 25% of the gross national product of the United States. The black budget currently consumes $1.25 trillion per two years. At least this amount is used in black programs, like those concerned with deep underground military bases. Presently, there are 129 deep underground military bases in the United States. They have been building these 129 bases day and night, unceasingly since the early 1940s. Some of them were built even earlier than that. These bases are basically large cities underground connected by high-speed magnetolevitan trains that have speeds up to Mach 2. Several books have been written about this activity. Al Billick has my only copy of one of them. Richard Souter, a Ph.D. architect, has risked his life by talking about this. He worked with a number of government agencies on deep underground military bases. In around where you live, in Idaho, there are 11 of them. The average depth of these bases is over a mile, and they again are basically whole cities underground. They all are between 2. 66 and 4.25 cubic miles in size. They have laser drilling machines that can drill a tunnel 7 miles long in one day. The Black Project sidestepped the authority of Congress, which as we know is illegal. Right now, the New World Order is depending on these bases. If I had known at the time I was working on them that the New was involved, I would not have done it. I was lied to rather extensively.